And thanks everyone for joining us. This is the Wednesday, March 20th, 2019 meeting of the Amherst Planning Board. First item on our agenda is minutes. And we have minutes in our packet from Wednesday, March 6th, 2019. We can absolutely turn up the volume on the microphones. That's not a problem. If members of the board have had a chance to review the minutes, I'd entertain a motion on the minutes of March 6th. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Those are approved unanimously. The next item on our agenda is the public comment period. And this public comment period is for the purpose of public comment not related to items further down the agenda. Is there any public comment not related to other items on our agenda for tonight? Is your microphone on? Yes, the microphone is activated. Seeing no public comment, we're going to move on to the next item on our agenda. Actually, we have two minutes until that next item. So we're going to move down our agenda to item 5A under old business. This is SPR 2005-00001 CRES Development Company, Big Y Plaza, 175 University Drive. Review of proposed signs and new awnings for Omi Omai. Apologies if I don't get the pronunciation on that correct. Vietnamese Eatery at Big Y Plaza in accordance with condition number two of SPR 2005-00001. We have that material in our packet. And if I understand correctly, we are um, in keeping with a condition on the original site plan review, which has signs, new signs brought back to us for approval whenever a new sign is proposed. And if I could ask staff, is the sign that's being proposed in accordance with all relevant sections of the zoning bylaw? Yes, they are. Are there any board member comments or questions about these signs? Maria? Um, I should probably recuse myself from the vote because I worked on the project. Thank you for that. Other comments, questions? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor? And that's unanimous. With one abstention. So shortly we're going to move on to our 705 item. All right, we're now gonna move on to SPR 2019-04. This is Amherst Community Television, DBA Amherst Media, corner of Gray Street and Main Street. And in accordance with Mass Law, this uh, public hearing has been posted and notice sent to abutters. This says, site plan review is to request site plan review approval to construct a new building and associated site improvements for Amherst Media, a 501c3 educational institution under section 3.330.0 of the zoning bylaw in the BN, that's the Neighborhood Business Zoning District, map 14B, parcels 250 and 251. Are there any board member disclosures on this item? Seeing none, we'll move to the applicant's presentation. Please introduce us and tell you tell us about your project. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, board members. I'm Jim Lesko, the executive director of Amherst Media for the past 12 years. The importance is we've been searching for a new location that whole period since uh, like two years after I started. We were evicted by our uh, in our current facility is at 246 College Street, the old electric plant. Uh, we've been in since 1991. The um, Western Mass Electric Company at that time, part of Northeast Utilities said that they would not renew our lease. 
that was very stunning to us uh, out of the blue, but we started looking immediately. Um, personally, I've visited over 25 sites, both rental, building, uh, within the town's uh, uh, boundaries. I <laughs> also worked closely with the town at one point where they had South Street School, better known as the Fort River Annex to some, was considered where we hired uh, Metcalf Associates from uh, Northampton and actually had plans drawn up, but this town was going to do remediation on that building, and they lost their community development block grant money that year, so that did not move forward. I just want to give you a little historical uh, background here for you. Our role here in the town is for 43 years been training individuals to turn their own power of, of, of communication to cover their own viewpoints and the town's viewpoints on cultural, political, and arts, anything of the events that are happening in town. Uh, we're very proud to have three channels, cable channels, 12, 15, and 17, which tonight's is currently live on 17 and streaming. That's what we do for the town. That's part of what we do. We're also a community center where a lot of people come in and use our facilities. In uh, 2011, we were approached by Jerry Gadera, who was the developer of this larger estate, which was the Hills Estate that was cut up into a number of parcels. And there's two parcels that were left, the two that are in front of you tonight. Uh, <clears throat> we looked at the parcels. We said we would like to have that rezoned if we were going to be considering it for purchase. Uh, rezoning occurred at the town meeting with two thirds vote. Um, it also went in front of the planning <coughs> board at that time with a seven to zero vote, I believe, with the encouragement that this would, would help the depot center, that it would help that part of that commercial center that was struggling down there. Um, we eventually paid $340,000 for those pieces of properties, the two parcels, that immediately was an investment into the historic district. And what I mean by that is that the Barbara Gadara Trust was able to use that money to buy 14 Gray Street from her son, Jerry Cadera, which he then moved up to the Hills House and invested that money into the renovation of what was the former Boys and Girls Club that was, had, had gone into disrepair. So quite honestly, our money was the started that whole renovation of the large house in question right now. Without going on too much longer, I would like to turn this over, uh, but first of all, I wanna say that we had very specific criteria that we looked for. We wanted to be as close to downtown as we could, to be a vital economic development component within the town, to make it easier for people to come in and use our facilities. We never were on the bus route. We never had public transportation. This has public transportation in front of it, okay? We also looked for making sure that we had American uh, Disability Act compatibility in the location. It's very important for us. A lot of the properties I looked at did not in Amherst. We needed something that was rent affordable for us. Most of the rents that we looked at around the greater downtown, we could not meet. So building our own was a, a chance to do sustainability long range, that we wanted to be here for another 43 years or beyond to help service this community. And we fought the nexus of that location in the, what became the cultural district and a historical district where we're the recorder of the archiving of this town's history and, and involvement of people was very important. We want to bring people into the historic district, not just to have it as a drive-by. We're very, very much believe in the district and we want to help it flourish. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is that uh, with me tonight, I'm about to turn the meeting over to uh, Bucky, uh, who is our Sprinkle, who's our engineer. Also present is our, our legal uh, counsel, Michael Pilt. Uh, Michael has uh, been doing pro bono for us because he not only believes in this project, but he believes in the mission of Amherst Media. I was asked to say that, and I am very proud to say that on his behalf. Also have Ed Severance behind me, who is a treasurer of the board and also landscaping questions if that should come up. And also the president of the board, Dee Shabazz, is sitting right next to him, and we have a number of other board directors here. So I want to thank you very much for hearing us. And again, I'm here if there's any questions that come up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> um, as Jim indicated, my name is Bucky Sparkle, and I am uh, with the engineering company as engineer. Uh, and I'm going to be presenting the site plan application and the plans, uh, as well as uh, already addressing, I hope, uh, some of the several issues that have come to light from public comment and the local historic district commission meeting that happened last week. 
Uh, so tonight's presentation is a little bit longer than I would normally do because I'm going to try and address these things, you know, preemptively. Hopefully that'll tighten things up a little bit after uh, the presentation during the public comment period, as well as address some things that uh, have been a little bit uh, perhaps soft in the record so far. Um, so as Jim mentioned, uh, Amherst Media is a 501c3 nonprofit, has been here since 1977. Uh, looking for a new home, trying to find a permanent home to support its educational goals, uh, and has very specific site requirements. Uh, we've looked at quite a number of sites prior to my ever being involved here. Um, and tonight what I'm going to talk about is uh, the formal application request uh, at first, uh, go over some of the background uh, of how we got to where we are, and Jim touched on a little bit of that. Uh, the design process, uh, because there have been a lot of questions about why does the site look like it does, uh, talk about the site plan itself, and then move on to uh, the, the content of the application itself, and I'll probably move through that a little more quickly, uh, some of the less interesting stuff that I've got to offer. Um, so uh, on the formal side, we are seeking site plan review uh, and approval under the Amherst bylaws section. 3.330.0, uh, a nonprofit educational institution for a new building uh, at the site in question on the corner of Main and Gray Street. Uh, we are also formally requesting a waiver from uh, at least the majority of the planning board rules and regulations, Article 2, Sections 3B, additional item number 6, which discusses a traffic impact statement. I will talk uh, about traffic impact. Uh, but we're hoping that we don't have to do a full traffic study uh, for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> uh, from uh, the historic perspective of what's been going on here, uh, in 2006, five new lots were uh, created through the ANR process. Uh, and they all were approved by this board. Of course, uh, ANR is fairly by right. Uh, and the minimum zoning requirements were met. So that took the Hills property and subdivided it uh, for the benefit of the owner at the time, as well as ultimately for the benefit of the historic structure itself. As Jim mentioned, it did ultimately create the funding to uh, preserve and rehabilitate that property, uh, which I think is in everyone's best interest. Um, a couple of years later, once it became developable lots on Main Street in front of the house, uh, there was movement in the town and actually an approved vote to attempt to buy uh, the property with CPA funds. Uh, that attempt was unfortunately not successful. Um, and then some years later, in 2013, uh, the, the owner at the time, Mr. Jerry Gadera, went through and petitioned the town to change the zoning. Uh, at the planning board meeting, uh, which would recommend to the town meeting, uh, the, the board did vote unanimously to change the zoning. And in the report, I just want to point out um, a quote that if Amherst Media purchased the property, doing so would, quote, add a strong cultural and public service element to the depot center and would strengthen this mixed use center from the standpoints of design, function, and economic viability. Uh, so this has been. Um, you know, a long time coming here that this property has been opened up for commercial development. And while it did not happen immediately upon the lots being created, we are looking at that today. Uh, in 2013, after the zoning was changed, Amherst Media did purchase the property uh, and has begun its process of uh, fact-finding and uh, design iterations to uh, present a proposal here. Um, in 2018, this town also accepted an easement for the sidewalk. Uh, this is a, a minor detail, but uh, the widening of Main Street for Turning Lane at Triangle uh, pushed uh, public infrastructure, the sidewalk, onto uh, what was private land, uh, which is all fine and good. We don't have any problems with that. It's just one more thing that has occurred uh, to get us here today. Um, uh, one of the things I also want to talk about sort of preemptively is uh, that I know there are letters that have been submitted to the board, have been handed around the neighborhood to abutters, uh, as well as have been in uh, the local newspapers uh, that have some errors, shall we say. Uh, and 
there's a lot of opinion in that, which is fine. I want to talk to some of the points that have been made that I think have stirred some of the emotion and perspectives uh, that we have heard in the last couple of weeks as we've moved the project through the public process. Um, uh, one of the things that has been indicated is that Amherst Media uh, claimed that the lots were unbuildable. Um, this is not true. If, of course, they thought they were unbuildable, they would have never gone on to purchase the land. Uh, there was some confusion about a variance being needed uh, at the time uh, that this uh, occurred, is my understanding, predating me. Uh, but it turns out that no variance was required, so there really was never a question of buildable or not buildable. Um, there is uh, some idea that the, uh, the current layout of the property uh, is, is different than a plan proposed by the original, the previous owner. Uh, there have been a lot of owners of that piece of land. Uh, um, Gadara and his contractor did present to the board a plan showing uh, a building on the east side of the site. Um, this was not Amherst, Amherst Media's plan. Uh, it was, uh, from my interpretation, an idealized layout of what the site could be if we went on to development. Uh, it was not, from my perspective, a vetted plan through an engineering perspective. Uh, it takes about three seconds standing on that property to realize that the plan proposed uh, that was showing an idealized situation was in fact uh, not possible uh, due to reasons I'll talk about later. The property uh, can't sustain a building on the east side, unfortunately. Um, it is true that an offer of uh, just over a quarter million dollars has been made. Uh, it is quite a bit of money. Uh, and that has been made by an abutter at 38 Gray Street, uh, the owner of the Henry Hills house. And uh, while well, that offer is appreciated, um, there has been uh, some promulgation that is uh, an, an exceptionally generous offer. Yes, it's a lot of money, uh, but the price is based upon, uh, from the letter that I read, uh, an average of residential building properties that are strewn across the town. Uh, a great deal of which are in fairly rural areas. They do not reflect the town's assessed value of the property, which is uh, $352,600, uh, nor do they reflect the fair market value, which is in excess of $400,000. Uh, further, it ignores the rarity of a commercial site at this location with the prerequisite assets that Amherst Media has been seeking, the bus route being uh, central to downtown location, um, and I think one thing that Jim didn't mention is also being a media company, there is a requirement to have direct access to uh, a high power internet bandwidth, uh, a trunk line, so to speak. That is also a very rare thing to find. This site has it. So uh, even just from a dollar's perspective, even if that, the offer were made to recoup the land value, there's been additional investment. And they've been looking for a decade. I've looked at 25 different sites. This is the site for them, uh, and it hasn't been uh, lightly selected. Um, there's also been a lot of talk about water problems, and I think when people say water problems, they're talking about stormwater prob problems and drainage. Uh, I've heard the site called a virtual wetland, amongst other things, uh, from articles in the paper, et cetera. So I want to point out, um, you know, having been the person who dug the holes into the earth to take a look at what's going on, assess the upland hydraulic characteristics and uh, other tributary flow from abutters, there are no unusual water conditions on this site whatsoever. This is a normal site in Massachusetts. Uh, it does have um, groundwater that is, you know, higher than we would like, but high groundwater is also extremely common and the plague of thousands of acres of land in Amherst many of which have uh, buildings on it. Uh, obviously, there are abutters that are managing the water situation just fine, uh, and there are very normal uh, mechanisms to address the, the stormwater and the groundwater. And I'll talk about those in more detail later, <laughs> maybe a bit too much. Uh, uh, in terms of creating the plan, um, I, I think I already covered some of these points. Uh, we've been looking for a little while. Uh, Amherst Media has been in discussion with uh, both uh, this, uh, the planning department, not this board per se, but the department and staff, and the local historic district commission uh, meeting uh, multiple times with each of these entities since 2013, trying to get uh, a, a sense of what they would need to do for a successful application. 
Uh, the abutters have been informed of the process as information has, co has coalesced. There have been meet and greets. Plans have been presented. There have been discussions um, even prior to my being involved in this project, which was in 2017 is when I was brought in. Um, so to talk a little bit, to, to leave the, the background uh, behind uh, and moving on to, to what's there now and eventually what we hope will be there, uh, the property is just over 24,000 square feet uh, with parcel IDs that have previously been identified. It is zoned uh, neighborhood business, the BN area uh, designation. It is, of course, in the Emily Dickinson Historic District. Um, and the site has very little in terms of features other than being fully grassed, sloping from northwest to southeast. So uh, looking at the existing condition just briefly to reiterate, uh, the big black line, roughly a rectangle is the site. Uh, the squiggly lines, those are the contours. So the elevation is at the highest in the top left of the drawing, at the lowest in the bottom right of the drawing. Uh, north is roughly, it is up. So the east side of the site, I need to point out now while everybody can see the contours, that is the low side of the site. This is where all the water drains to. And we're going to manage it. Um, uh, in terms of uh, my getting involved in the project, we looked at over, actually well over a dozen concepts. A dozen were presented uh, in, to various degrees uh, to the Amherst Media Board. Uh, and everybody was most interested in putting the building uh, on the east side, the right side of the site. Uh, so just a couple examples of these. Uh, you can see a, a couple concepts where uh, the sort of the reddish area is uh, the building footprint on the east side of the site, as far as east, east as we could get it, right up against the lot line. Uh, uh, in doing so, we discovered several factors. Uh, one is uh, we had difficulty getting a driveway that met uh, town requirements behind the, prop, behind the building and up onto the western side of the site. Uh, mainly because we had to build, if this site were planned to lay out, we would have to build the uh, parking lot um, very, very high above existing grade. I'm talking a 10-foot high retaining wall against the pavement, against the sidewalk. Um, and even that has a whole bunch of design problems and infeasible issues uh, regarding stormwater management, as well as it being against the bylaw in general. You can't put a 10-foot high wall against the sidewalk. So even if the building were to the east, any building to the east, and the parking were to the west, this creates uh, a building-sized retaining wall in the same location, uh, as well as coming far short of meeting uh, state-required stormwater management standards. Uh, we tried a few things. I'll show you a couple other options. We tried to stick the detention uh, down on the east side, uh, uh, which is effectively what we're trying to do now. So these squiggly lines would be an open detention basin. Uh, this particular layout with the parking being on the high side created uh, an earthen wall. Basically, we would have to build a dam at the corner of Main Street and Gray Street, something about nine or 10 feet high also of earth piled up there. We wouldn't need a wall. Uh, not, not only does this then become a dam in the state's viewpoint, but it would create an incredibly high mass uh, that would also block views uh, as well as be incredibly unattractive. And we decided that this was also not a good idea. A couple other not good ideas uh, up here. Uh, we tried shrinking the building footprint, all sorts of inadequacies uh, with how that played out. Um, but it does put, and in both of these cases, we started to realize we have to put the building on the west side. We really tried to not do it. Um, the detention, the low spot is down here. So these are storm water management items. Uh, and on this particular loopy road, which also doesn't meet all sorts of bylaw requirements, there just wasn't even the physical space necessary because the parking lot and the grading for it would impinge uh, our ability to manage the stormwater even in an underground situation. <clears throat> um, talk about a few of the constraints of the site. Uh, we have requirements uh, for safe uh, distance from intersection. We have to be at least 75 feet away from the intersection at Main Street, and we are uh, just over 80 feet away. Uh, we had to avoid the new turning and bike lane that was uh, recently installed prior to Amherst Media purchasing the property that uh, services Triangle Street. 
the lot itself is relatively thin to relatively long, so it, it promotes a wide layout. We can't stack things back further. Uh, and uh, stormwater, uh, the requirements are our requirements. This is the Wetlands Protection and the Clean Waters Act that we are addressing here. Uh, it's not anything that we would or would even want to just ignore, uh, and we cannot minimize the requirements as a new commercial development. Any commercial development has to go through these same steps and would provide a similar set of mitigation options that uh, we are proposing. So I, I'm going to repeat that, that uh, this is a business zoned, commercial zoned property. Any and all properties will have to do the same thing that we have to do. Uh, and this is because water flows downhill. Uh, and the groundwater, while not extreme, does elevate the system. If the groundwater were 10, 12 feet down, we could bury things a little bit better. We could wiggle things around a little bit better. Uh, maybe not get the site, the building to the east side, but slide it. We cannot do this. Uh, gravity is not our friend in this circumstance. Um, there were, have been a lot of comments about building placement. Uh, so the building placement has been determined um, by the, the physical characteristics of the property. Um, and. Uh, also, as well as, as I mentioned, the stormwater characteristics. Uh, so there has been uh, recently an investigation to see, you know, the, the Wetlands Protection Act and the state stormwater standards say, hey, you need to take your stormwater, manage it on your site, and you definitely have to take the, any water from impervious area and infiltrate at the place of, of impervious area. I have to infiltrate at this site. Uh, in and of itself, that, that's a very limiting condition. But we thought, well, maybe we can take some of the volume storage, which does take up some bulk of the system. Maybe we can take that and put it somewhere else in town, which would be a highly unconventional uh, and fairly untested uh, process. Uh, so we talked to the town engineer. And uh, what we found out uh, after they did a reasonable evaluation was that as far as public land goes, town land goes, there, there really isn't anything available. It's basically road right away. Um, and then that would force us then to make use of private property, uh, parties that are downstream, which means that the municipal drain pipes would need to carry the, uh, the storm load, the shock loading of intense storm flow during heavy rain events from our site uh, down Main Street through the uh, Aspen Chase apartment complex down Route 9 uh, across, uh, what is it, South Street and Belchertown Road uh, just past um, Florence Bank down there. That's where that pipe outlets. Eventually, it's a six-foot diameter pipe, but it's only 12 inches at our site. The discharge from our site requires a 10-inch pipe. So if we take a 12-inch pipe that's already relatively full, we're not going to add 10-inch pipe worth of water to it uh, without uh, severely increasing the likelihood of flooding of properties between our site and all the way down to the southeast portion of town. Uh, that's a lot of properties that could be impacted, even, even if it were permissible. Um, it would require multiple studies, hydraulic studies, hydrogeologic studies. There would have to be a private sale of land and easements and access roads built uh, on properties that would have no interest, vested interest in supporting our needs. And since this would be an unconventional approach, the town would have to approve it virtually every level. Town council, various boards, various committees would all be involved. We're talking probably a multi-year project and tens and tens of thousands of dollars for the studies and, of course, for land acquisition rights. Uh, it would be prohibitively costly if it is all even technically feasible, uh, which means that it would be an unreasonable burden. We do need to manage the stormwater on site, uh, just like any other commercial development would. Um, looking at the dimensional regulations, then, uh, so some of the physical characteristics of the site. Uh, the zoning has certain requirements. We are meeting and exceeding all of them. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of leave this one at that. Um, so this is uh, the sort of the technicolor version of what we are wanting to do from a plan view. It's a kind of drawing that makes a lot of sense to a civil engineer, but you know, the people sitting in the crowd aren't always going to get everything. So um, this is where this magic pointer is going to come in. 
the building itself uh, is in the, the reddish shade. So this is the footprint of the building, of course. Um, and then we have attendant sidewalks and ramps out front and a gyroscope that's doing everything. Uh, we have, oh boy. Uh, uh, the parking is in gray, so we have a two-way access drive that comes in, parking for 14 vehicles, one of which would be a handicapped space. There is also an access drive to the west because the, the studio is in this corner of the building and it, large equipment comes and goes through there. So we have a, a chain across here. So normally access isn't provided, uh, but that would be accessible to staff and to the fire department. Uh, down further on the site, uh, this is the stormwater management system, this grid of lines. We have been successful in doing an underground detention system uh, with a very high filtration rate uh, which is excellent for the environment. Uh, and then ultimately it will discharge uh, down a pipe into the municipal drain, the catch basin right here. Uh, we also have a you know, sanitary sewer line, very helpful for modern dwellings, a water line, equally helpful. Uh, we have an overhead utility line in red here uh, for power and uh, communications. And in yellow is sort of the pipe dream of a gas connection. Uh, we know that there's a moratorium, but we decided we would add it to the permitting process just in case it was accessible. Uh, out back, uh, in areas that aren't as visible, uh, there is a small pad for a generator. Uh, a facility like this does need some backup power from time to time. Uh, and the bike rack, there is a, a six or eight unit uh, bike rack uh, behind the building. Uh, near one of the rear entrances. Uh, let's, see. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, I do want to mention also uh, one of the features of the site would be a, a retaining wall. So the very end of the parking lot and the turning around at the turnaround for vehicles uh, is up to a 48 inch high retaining wall. This would be a Goshen stone wall, a natural material that would have uh, been indicative of the period uh, for the historic district, no you know, segmental block wall kind of things. Um, and we also have uh, the fire department. I should also have one more mention here. Uh, they asked that we widen the pavement in this area uh, to provide a custom fit for their largest vehicle uh, so they could get in there and vehicles could exit from the property at the same time, so it provides plenty of space for them and plenty of space for vehicles to leave the site in an emergency situation. Uh, we can of course come back to the site plan uh, to talk about any details if we like, but I want to move on uh, for at least a little while to the architecture, which is probably uh, the hottest topic here. Uh, I'll preface this by saying, based on the feedback that we've received in the last 10 days, uh, we are going to be working on it. Uh, so what you see next is the Current, oh, you know, I forgot about this slide. I'm sorry, so let me take one step back. So this is getting into um, the neighborhood imagery. So uh, before we get into the, the details, uh, we, we want to kind of show some of the impact that this will have on the neighborhood. The sight lines of the buildings behind it have been uh, a key point uh, of concern for lots of people. So uh, back here is the Henry Hills house. Uh, at 38 Gray Street, just to the west, is uh, the Amherst Women's Center, which was, I believe, the Leonard Hills House, uh, which used to occupy the entirety of, of this land. And eventually, a few lots have been divided off and built upon uh, in lovely fashion. Uh, and these lots were also divided off the two up front. Uh, so the things that I want to point out from uh, this drawing is, uh, on the left is the proposed layout, where the building is in orange. Uh, and this sort of light gray is the paved area just to give a sense of scale and the stormwater, of course, is down here. So uh, presently, uh, I have a couple of ray lines drawn out from where you can possibly see at least the center of the Henry Hills house from because it's blocked on the east by the house on Gray Street. It's blocked on the west by the fence for the Emily Dickinson properties. Uh, so we have a 63 degree arc uh, of visibility for uh, the center point here, um, I'm only analyzing one point that's directly behind the development. And in installing a building, uh, and there are two lots here, we're installing just one building, uh, it does, of course, break this contiguous arc. 
uh, into a, a 28 degree arc and a 13 degree arc, uh, which come together to be a 41 degree viewing arc. So we've got about two thirds uh, of the existing arc is visible from the pedestrian way, the right of way. Um, on uh, a hypothetical situation where the building would be placed on the east, which we already know from a technical standpoint is not possible, but just to give a sense, uh, because there's been a lot of uh, effort, move the building, move the building, or uh, sentiment to move the building. Uh, in doing so, uh, the arc is still broken. Uh, it's a 49 degree arc that is visible to the street. So 41 degrees versus 49 degrees. Yes, it is a contiguous arc. Uh, I, we don't refute that whatsoever. Uh, but it's, it's a reduction by about 25% versus a reduction of about uh, a third. So it's, it, it's not like this view isn't going to be impinged upon regardless of where the building is. Um, and one of the things that we have uh, considered is that knowing that the, the, the view to this, this beautiful property uh, will be impinged upon by whatever development happens here, and we hope it's the Amherst Media Project. Um, they have uh, considered uh, offering uh, at the back of their property uh, actually a viewing station. So we would provide a public easement access so that anybody who wanted to can come up uh, and actually cut a third of the distance from the public right away. You want to see that building, you have to be on the street and you're uh, 200 and some feet away, you can cut about a third of that distance away. So it actually gives people an opportunity to get closer to the building, see the details better, take better photos. Amherst Media is also willing to provide uh, an, uh, an audio history uh, option that would be provided through some technical means or another, either a mechanical thing at the viewing station with a bench or a uh, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth kind of thing being broadcast from their building so that the public uh, can get a closer look at both of the buildings. You'll be able a, a closer frontal perspective than is currently available in the public right away. And we hope that this would, to a degree, make up for uh, the, the break in the continuity of the current viewscape, getting people a little closer to the action, so to speak. Uh, so all right, so here's what I thought I was going to talk about, and that's the architecture. Um, and so the, the building itself was designed by Great Country Timber Frames, who unfortunately could not be here tonight. They are uh, a post and beam type of company. Uh, they're not a, a prefab, you know, mobile home kind of company. Uh, and they were selected for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which was post and beam construction uh, has a lot of uh, efficacy in the tall ceilings high buildings, which when you have a television studio is important because inside of this structure uh, is a very tall ceiling and that is just part, part of the mission of Amherst Media. Uh, there's also an elevator involved uh, to get to second floor storage. There is a fair amount of heavy equipment that needs to get moved around. So uh, the, the elevator and the studio have a very strong impact on the overall size uh, and mass, if you will, of the structure. So once those uh, items are sort of predetermined, uh, it, it led to uh, sort of a, a boxier or more barn-like, as some people have said, uh, structure. Now, we have received last week uh, at the Local Historic District Commission um, very strong advice uh, to uh, not to abandon the Great Country timber frames necessarily in their structural design, but bring on... Um, an experienced architect who uh, is not just an experienced architect, but experienced in historic buildings and historic neighborhoods. Uh, there is an interesting juxtaposition on the north side of the street. It is residential, the Italianette style, and on the south side of the same street uh, are low brick buildings, a different kind of commercial style. Uh, and this proposed structure sits in between them. So uh, it, it poses a few uh, challenges, I would say, to whoever's going to be coming along and tidying up the aesthetic of this structure. Um, but the, the structure itself, in terms of size and mass, is, is relatively fixed to meet the minimum requirements of the, uh, the owner's mission. Um, you can see slightly uh, the sign. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit on a black and white version. 
uh, face forward. The building sign itself is proposed currently at six by three feet to sit above the main door to be lit from above. Um, uh, this current drawing has uh, three lamps above it. I think the lighting designer said we are going to be just fine with two, so we're going to adjust that when we make adjustments to the architectural design. Um, leaving the building and moving on to the landscape a little bit. Uh, the landscape was selected uh, be, uh, for screening purposes, the bylaw, especially when you have a, a commercial district abutting a residential district, the bylaw is pretty strong about how to screen uh, residences from commercial. Normally, people don't want to be you know, living in one place and looking to the back of somebody's parking lot. Uh, the back of most businesses is reasonably unattractive, so strong screening is usually provided. And uh, in addition to the residential area, the screening has been to uh, conceal to the greatest extent possible the parking lot, another thing that is generally not an attractive feature of buildings, uh, though quite a modern necessity. Uh, so this plan, uh, the, this plan was developed uh, well, partially in conjunction according to the bylaw and the plants were selected by the Taylor Davis Landscape Company. Um, uh, it's all on my letterhead but we worked in conjunction on this uh, and in brief basically uh, around the parking lot we have screening of uh, you know, vegetation that will eventually reach 9 and 14 feet tall through here. Uh, feathered grasses at the end of the parking area and the turnaround. Uh, another section of, uh, you know, 9 to 14 foot tall vegetation. This green rectangle is part of the stormwater management system. Uh, actually, it requires vegetation as part of the filtering process. Uh, so we've selected vegetation necessary for that. That also has a degree of aesthetic value. Uh, an island, a uh, green island is required in the bylaw for parking lots over 10 spaces. So we have an island here with a tree, uh, a white fir here, um, and then this long green strip on the back of the property as well as on the west side of the building, which is a relatively windowless side. It's the, it's the studio side. Um, this plan is proposing emerald green arborvitae. Um, and in the feedback that we've received, uh, there is concern that our screen from the neighborhood is also going to be a screen from the street. Uh, it, it, to a degree, it feels like we, jokingly, I say we need to put a two-way mirror back here so the, the residents uh, to the north uh, doesn't have to face the, the, the business side of the business. At the same time, really hoping to allow the streetscape, the pedestrian way, uh, to have visual access behind the building. So uh, to, the, to the buildings behind it, to the Henry Hills House and the Amherst Women's Center. So uh, the landscape drawing that you see now, uh, we're also going to be revisiting uh, and seeing if we can find a way to <clears throat> provide adequate screening for this residence that is quite close to the lot line. Uh, from all the business that's going on here. At the same time, potentially open up some of these areas on the edges so uh, it's easier to see past the building. Uh, that or provide lower plantings, uh, in which case we wouldn't be able to screen the business from the residences, but that need, A, may not be a strong concern to the owner. Uh, right now, this is still owned by the Gadara family, who was the original, or at least the previous owners of all the land and did all the lot development. Um, so we're, we're going to work on the landscaping, that is to say. Um, but we are trying to, to meet uh, needs that are currently, it seems, conflicting. Uh, and we'll get back to you uh, with a little more information on that. Uh, the lighting situation, we have, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we're proposing fixtures that would be uh, reasonably appropriate uh, for period uh, structures. So we have, uh, I don't even know what to call this type of lamp fixture, but uh, my parents had it on their house. And uh, it's also found very similarly in uh, other historic districts quite close. Um, and those are for, so uh, at the top, these are the pole mounted lights. They will be mounted about 10 feet high. These are the wall mounted lights, will be about eight feet high. There are eight of the poles, nine of the wall mounted. The sign will have these uh, little downcast uh, gooseneck style lamps. Um, 
although two of them shown on the strong are white, that's just because the catalog shows them white. They come in every color. We're picking black, which would also be uh, more of a period influence. Um, the little blue dots all over the plan uh, are the location of lights, and if we really need to get into the details, we can get into that. Uh, more importantly, all these little dots that are way too small at this scale, uh, this is the photometric plan that was provided by the light supplier. Uh, demonstrating that we're not letting light leak off the property. We are down to 0.0, .0 and in just a few cases, 0 0.1 foot candles at the property line and nothing past the property line, just past the property line. So uh, the light designer has done a good job of making sure we don't have light leaving the site. Um, all the lights are do have uh, caps over the top, uh, so they are downcast. Um, and it is amazingly difficult to find period lights that are dark sky compliant. Uh, it turns out that is a very modern thing, not, not a surprise, but uh, historic features, uh, historic lights tended to broadcast the light. Uh, so here again, we're between the modern world requirements of keep your lights pointed down and the historic requirements of let them shine everywhere. So, uh, so I think we've come up with a fairly good uh, compromise that bridges these two uh, situations. Uh, the lights themselves will uh, be on photoelectric timers, so they're not going to be burning all night long. They're going to go on a few hours before office opens, a few hours after it closes. Uh, there'll be motion detectors for uh, the lights near the building. So as pedestrians come and go, perhaps late at night, for safety reasons, the light is going to pop on for a little while, illuminate the path, and let them get safely to their destination off-site. Uh, continuing down the application process, uh, I want to talk a little about the erosion control uh, sediment um, precautions we're taking for the property. Uh, everything does drain from the uh, northwest corner down <coughs> here. So the green line that goes around the low side of the site, uh, this would be a, a sediment barrier, something like a silt fence, although we're probably going to be use uh, the sediment logs, They're a little more effective, easier to install. Uh, the yellow area would be a construction entrance, which would then be big, hunky rock that is designed to help knock off any uh, sticky earth, mud that has accumulated on construction vehicles. Uh, the shaded area through here uh, is sort of an option, depending on the time of year the construction happens, a sediment basin may be necessary. Uh, the sediment sort of fence or the, the log might be more than, more than enough, depending on rain and how fast grass is established. If we're going to need to control water in large volume, we'll install a sediment basin uh, at the low end of the site before the stormwater management system is installed. And then to protect the municipal drain system, there are two catch basins, one here and one here. We'll be installing uh, inlet filters. Should there be some kind of discharge from the site, then the catch basins themselves are each individually protected, uh, safeguarding the municipal system. Um, the, Town also has a requirement to do some fill calculations, uh, earthwork. Uh, so I want to point out that we did those calculations. The site, just by happenstance, balances very, very well at uh, 66 cubic yards of fill brought in, uh, which means that it's about an inch of fill over the entire site. This is nothing that anybody would ever notice if you were to lay it out flat. And of course, we're planning on pushing the earth around a little bit by, uh, it's a sloping site. Buildings require flat pads, so we're going to be cutting and filling through here, cutting and filling through here, and filling a little bit through here, which overall balances out to uh, close to zero, just 66 cubic yards. Um, another detail of the application is the management plan. Um, and I have already <coughs> talked about parking, lighting, and some of the sign details. The trash and recycling uh, are gonna be by bins. They won't be, uh, there won't be any dumpsters on site. Uh, the landscaping, uh, will be done by a professional landscape company. We recognize that uh, this uh, is a very visible property and the intention is to keep it in, in excellent shape all year round. The snow removal will also be by a professional contract, um, which is a safety and, and just you know, site access requirement. Uh, next up on the application requirements is uh, a traffic impact statement. So what I'm going to offer here tonight uh, hopefully falls into the realm of, of intuitive common sense. Uh, this is a small professional office. There are no more than five staff working there at any time and usually no more than, well, no more than four board members there at any given time. 
Uh, this is not a commercial development like a restaurant or retail or Dunkin' Donuts or a gas station where you've got trip after trip after trip being generated all day long during business hours. It's a few vehicles in and a few vehicles out over the course of the day, um, <clears throat> which is also uh, alleviated by uh, many of the interns and volunteers do arrive by bus. So with the bus stop being outside, they don't even generate vehicle trips. So this is a, a very low impact <laughs> Uh, no meaningful impact to Main Street. Uh, Gray Street is, is a fairly low volume road. Uh, it is one of the uh, one of several accesses to the high school in the back, uh, some blocks away. Um, so it does get a bit of traffic uh, during those peak times, uh, but it is effectively eventually a dead end road. It's not a through street uh, with uh, cars coming down from point A to point B that aren't local. So uh, because this is very low traffic generating site on a very busy street, a main street, and a not very busy street on Gray Street, which is the site access, we are requesting a waiver from uh, the, the full extent of Article 2, Section 3B, Additional Item 6 of the Planning Board Rules and Regulations, uh, which talks about a traffic impact statement and the potential for a traffic study. Uh, I think it's pretty intuitive that the nine staff some of them taking buses are not gonna, not gonna make a dent on what's going on on Main Street. Um, uh, just for completeness, uh, I did mention before, uh, there will need to be an easement for the sidewalk. Uh, that has already been worked out in details with the engineer and then already accepted at the town meeting last year. Uh, the applicant's happy to provide that. Um, and on Monday, uh, we received comments from the town engineer, Jason Skeels. He and I uh, consulted about a, a variety of issues of this property before I sunk my teeth into it, uh, particularly the stormwater management. Uh, I'm very pleased that he has no concerns whatsoever about the stormwater management system as proposed. Uh, it's, frankly, I think it's a great system. Uh, we knew that we wanted to do a good job on this one. Um, there were a few minor technical points, uh, just some of those including rebuilding the entire sidewalk on Gray Street. We're going to be cutting it up partially. He wants the whole thing put back. Sounds good. It'll be neater when it's done. He wants me to connect to the sanitary sewer system slightly differently. Easy. Uh, there's a little bit of water coming over the sidewalk that is below our stormwater system. He wants us to manage that as well. That is totally possible. Um, and things, something I never run into before is we need to fortify our site against the sidewalk plow, um, which I found novel. Uh, and apparently this is also not a big deal. So we're going we're gonna to handle all of these points and Jason's letter indicated that we're in good shape from a technical standpoint. Um, so wrapping up this uh, longer than average presentation, thank you for bearing with me. Um, you know, we believe that this project does address all the aspects of the bylaw um, and that uh, we do know that there are some architectural issues uh, that need to be addressed. We will be returning to the local historic district commission uh, after upgrading our plans, so to speak. Uh, very minor issues with uh, infrastructure. Uh, and I will mention, I will say just a little bit here um, from my notes that you know, Amherst Media it, it is a community-oriented public <coughs> service uh, and that the existing studio is definitely inadequate for them presently and they are about to be evicted anyway. Uh, the proposed building will support the nonprofit educational services and regional stewardship, stewardship that Amherst Media provides. Um, and we do want to reemphasize and point out again to the public at large in general and the board specifically that uh, there, there has been a history of this property, um, we're creating the lots and rezoning the lots prior to Amherst Media's uh, ownership of the property. Uh, we understand that those choices were not uh, popular by everyone, although there was a lot of economic motivation, development motivation in the town to do so. Uh, what we are trying to do is an extension of that process as it has already trans transpassed. Um, so we do recognize there's additional work needed. Uh, and uh, we are also because we received so much information in the last 10 days, earlier this week, even in the last few hours, uh, something I n have never done before is, is formally request that the board not take a vote tonight. 
that we hear, but the public has to say, give us a chance to come back to address some of the issues that have come up in the last, <clears throat> last couple of days uh, and get back to you with a revised uh, landscape plan and more importantly, a revised architectural plan. Um, and with that, we do welcome the comments of the public, the input from the board, we'll be paying close attention. Maybe we can answer some questions that haven't been raised so far. Uh, I'd be happy to talk again. And we thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for that presentation. So I want to speak just a little bit about process now. So we have a standard process for those of you who may not have attended a site plan review uh, hearing in the past that we're going to go through. Uh, we've just heard from the applicant. Shortly, we're going to talk about the site visits that took place yesterday. Then we're going to turn to questions from the board, followed by public comment. We're going to give the applicant an opportunity to respond. Then we'll have final comments and questions from the public applicant and the board in that order. And as the applicant alluded to, that might not all happen tonight. It's possible that this hearing could be continued. I uh, also want to talk a little bit about voting requirements. So this is a site plan review request. It requires five out of seven of the planning board members to vote in the affirmative to pass. We have five present tonight. There's two planning board members who aren't present, and they can vote under mass law if they review the material that was presented at this hearing. Additionally, as many may know, uh, the applicant was before the Dickinson Local Historic District recently. That is a parallel process to this. The, the board and the district are not advisory to each other. The applicant needs approval from both to proceed with the project. We are going to hear for informational purposes from a representative of the Dickinson Local Historic District Commission tonight. Um, and finally on process, because this project is located in a National Historic Register District, the planning board is allowed to use what's called design review board standards. Um, that's section 3.2 of the zoning bylaw, and it's additional criteria that the board can use in reviewing the project. So that all being said, we're going to move on to the report on the site visits, and there were two site visits held yesterday. I attended one of them, two other board members attended at the other time, and much of the material in the written site visit report, which is available to us, has already been stated by the applicant. I want to call attention to a few items that may not have been. Um, one being that there are currently encroachments on the property, not only from the town, but from on a butter with site improvements, and those are in the process of being addressed. Uh, additionally, I don't believe it was mentioned that Amherst Media has made an agreement with the VFW across the street to use the VFW parking lot for overflow parking. And during the course of one of the site visits, board members had inquired about the possibility of planting new street trees along Main Street because several old beech trees have been removed from the site. Were there any other comments or questions from board members who were present at the site visit? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to general questions and comments from the board. Christine? one's pretty easy. Um, I'm looking at a report from um, the Facili uh, Felicity Hardy Law Practice, and they bring into question that the area is 2,410 square feet because of the loss of lands, I think, on the street portion. Um, and you were using that, that same number. I is that the number of the actual site, or what is the property size right now? Uh, that is the number that the surveyor came up with. It does include the sidewalk. It does include the easement, so that is part of the property. Um, but the, the boundary does include the, the 24,010 square feet, yes. So that's a thin sliver along one side. What is the general number, then, if you excluded the sidewalk, the common way now? This is a bit of a wild guess. Um, uh, but the sidewalk impinges something like a hundred feet of the frontage of the property. It is uh, about four feet wide, not all of it uh, impinges. So I would say on average two feet wide over a hundred feet long, 200 square feet. So uh, we're still well over the 15,000 square foot um, number. We'd have to lose 9,000 square feet of property to the sidewalk. So we're good. Thank you. Thank you. So I do have a question, and it was useful and new information to me to learn that part of the a reason for the architecture as proposed was because of the need for higher ceilings due to the TV studio use. So what exactly are the, the heights of the um, rooms that are proposed and that are needed for that type of use? 
Um, from, from memory, and I, I do have the structural plans, and we can, we can bring them up, but uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the studio was 14 feet high, and, that's, uh, and uh, then there is additional storage space above that. Uh, so the overall structure to the roof line is 32 feet. Um, so that's, I think that's the tallest room in that building. Thank you. Maria. Um, could you talk a little more about the design process when you were saying that the building placement was determined by the physical site characteristics and the location was driven by stormwater management, but yet you studied you know, the, the building being on the east and then it needing a 10-foot retaining wall. Could you say more about Sure. The, I guess... You know, did the building come after all of the study of the site water management, or was it simultaneous, or could you just go a little more into okay. that process? So um, when I was brought into the project, uh, Amherst Media had already uh, begun pre preliminary work on a, on a building because I, I don't have much to work with until I have a good idea of, well, how big is your building? You know, what's it going to look like? So they, they offered that information. So to a degree, the, the building design uh, came first. And then I tried to stick it on the site. And where everybody wanted it was the, the slide on the, the left there, uh, placing the building on the east side of the site. Um, I had definite concerns that I would be able to make this work and still meet the, the law, um, and as well as uh, just general site feasibility. Um, and well, I talked about a very tall wall. So uh, if we have, so the stormwater has to be lower than the parking lot, has to be lower than uh, the impervious area. So in this case, uh, we're driving the parking lot to the higher side of the site, um, but the stormwater also has to be above, the stormwater management system also has to be above the groundwater table, uh, which basically means that you, you couldn't start the stormwater management system until basically finish grade of, as the site is now. So if you were to go out there and build a system on the grass on the west side of the site, it would be several feet tall and then uh, you'd be building pavements on top of that and having to slope the, the earth. So what ended up happening is that this face of the parking lot became extremely hall, tall. Um, I, you can only have 48 inches uh, of a wall up against the sidewalk, uh, and this was uh, in the vicinity of, of nine or 10 feet. Um, I, I did do this design uh, quite some time ago now, so uh, I don't remember every detail of it, but. Uh, it was an enormous edifice that would have been constructed. Basically, we would have built a house made out of rocks up against the sidewalk. It's a fairly opaque structure. Um, but that, again, is it's driven by the site conditions. It's driven by the fact that water flows downhill and uh, <clears throat> site access is uh, fairly fixed at this location. We have to be a minimum distance of 75 feet from the intersection. Uh, Putting the building in the corner where we would have loved it requires the driveway to come up uh, as steep as steep as we possibly could make it and still meet town rules. Uh, and then the what happens is that creates, as you can see from the back of the site, there's a one, two, three. I, I miscounted with this funny device. One, two, three, four, four or five feet of fall across here. Uh, so we we jack it up high in the back, and then the earth and the sidewalk are much much lower. So even though we come up a few feet, the earth is falling as we go. So the resultant adds up to be uh, quite an enormous structure. So even if we built a wall, that would bring slopes out this way uh, quite a bit till we got back to um, existing grade. Um, so unfortunately, we were stuck. And the building footprint, was that a design or was that purely square footage given to you by Amherst Media? Um, that, that was based on their preliminary design. They, they did development drawings uh, after I came along and said that it is actually feasible to build on the site, not where you want to build, but it's buildable and this footprint will work. You know, uh, there's a certain amount of you know, s due diligence you have to perform. Can you fit the stormwater? Can you fit the required parking? Can you fit uh, all your stuff for your business inside a building all on this site uh, and keep everything you know, safe for fire access, uh, et cetera. So uh, there, it was a little bit of chicken and egg. There was some building, but it was rough when I got involved. It was refined afterward. Mm -hmm. 
So, so would you say they weren't really designed together simultaneously? You sort of, like you were saying, chicken and egg, you kind of had a little bit of an idea of a building, and then you worked out management of the site, and then you came back, and it looks like the building footprint's not too far different from what it is now. So in a way, you, you were working with this mass, and then you tried to make it fit on the site. Yes, it's yeah. true. Um, you know, they, they had a, an ideal for what the building would look like, um, after I realized that it, it's problematic, no matter what we do, I tried to create space by shrinking the building, which wasn't really great for Amherst Media's needs, but from a site design, it created a little more room. Um, but even with this layout, we were still you know, forced to stick the building on the uphill side of the site and the stormwater on the downhill side of the site. But site design is iterative. It's building, site, building, site. They go back and forth for a little while until they settle. It's still, it's still iterative tonight. Christine? Just with that smaller, is, did that have an extra story or less storage? Like, it's much smaller. Where was the, like, was that even feasible? Um, well, I'll tell you, this footprint was um, my imagination. Uh, assuming that the Amherst Media could just arbitrarily add height to the building because it was a 40-foot building allowed. Uh, they were already anticipating a building of, of substantial height, and I figured if I'm going to cut the footprint down by 40% or something, that we're going to have to add another story. Uh, so now we would be talking roughly a 40-foot building uh, just to get the same volume as well as now we've got one more set of stairs inside of a professional office. It makes accessibility a little more difficult. They, at the time, they were not, I think, if I recall, they weren't planning on an elevator at the time, so this was kind of bad news. I know they weren't particularly happy that I did this, but I was, as they say, spitballing. I was trying to come up with a way to make this site work uh, in the most reasonable manner possible, uh, so I, I came with all sorts of shapes and ideas, uh, and I'll tell you, the stuff that I show you here, there's, there's problems with it. There really are. There's a reason we're not doing this. Thank you. Jack? Um, I have some comments, but the, they're kind of predicated on the, the historic uh, commission's uh, comments. And I might wait uh, if they're going to be the sp uh, first speaker to, to speak after that. But I, I do, uh, you're probably aware of the Berkshire design uh, letter that came in. Uh, the Berkshire design letter? Uh, the Berkshire design group. Uh, uh I know the group. I'm not sure I've seen a letter from that design firm. It's dated today, so ah, probably have. <laughs> not unusual. Okay. All right. Um, but they have some very good points with regard to the engineering aspects of it, storm uh, stormwater uh, related, uh, which um, uh, I agree with some of the points in my cursory review of it. I'm not an engineer, I'm a hydrogeologist, but uh, I do understand stormwater to some extent. So. I, I would love to review it. Great, and you'll have an opportunity, of course, to comment later, Jack. David? Can you, uh, can you speak a little bit more to your request for a waiver of the traffic <clears throat> excuse me, impact statement? Uh, I believe in your presentation you said it was intuitive primarily because it's um, Gray Street's a residential street, but it's, it's actually it's, confu it's, it's not an easy intersection because of the bus traffic that goes for two schools and then a lot of, and then whatever other parent traffic that, that is. Mm -hmm. um, and then also there are a lot of young teen drivers that are entering and exiting mm -hmm. from the schools there. Um, and so it's not, while it may be intuitive, I don't think it's quite actual. And so if you could speak a little bit more as to why, um, given the, the, the the fact that the, this is a, an important access point to these schools, mm -hmm. why, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not fully persuaded that it's intuitive, that, that there's no need for such a uh, sure. traffic impact study. Mm -hmm. um, the, the intuitive nature of my statement, I, I think, has to do with the uh, low volume of traffic and turning motions generated by this project relative to the traffic on Main Street, relative to the traffic on Gray Street, what Amherst Media's staff will be adding to that mix is minuscule. So 
you know, I'm I'm not standing here having done a full traffic count and having done the analysis. I've I've seen a variety of projects come and go, and you know, I I guess I have an insider's view that uh, intuitively uh, a project of this size that is quite small uh, would have a negligible impact on on a situation like this. Um, and I, I think that's the extent of that. Like there, there are a variety of things that happen on that street. Like every street, you know, I can't account for them all tonight. Additional comments, questions, Jack. Yeah, I, I think I'm good with the traffic study, given that uh, five employees and during the uh, site visit yesterday. I mean, one of the main uh, traffic uh, events you would have. Uh, the auction, which is no longer happening, uh, would will happen at the facility. So I, I, I do believe that you know traffic would be minimal uh, for their plans for this building. Yeah. If this were a retail establishment, draft Dunkin' Donuts, something like that, I would not be saying this. I, I would be insistent. I wouldn't want my stamp on a drawing uh, that I thought had uh, some danger affiliated with it. Uh, that is not the plan that we're looking at today. And I agree with your comments, Jack. But, but on David? The, but on the other hand, though, there's contingency for the overflow parking across the street. And so there are going to be occasions or, I mean, it's not, it's not so clear to me. There was no traffic yesterday, you're right, during the site visit. But um, there, are, there's, there's, there are intern, as you say, whether they're using public transportation or not, it can't be fully guaranteed. I'm concerned really about the traffic coming in and out from the schools, knowing from personal experience how sometimes that's rushed and there are cars and buses that obscure the sight lines. That, that, that's, that's where my concern is. That, that sounds like pre-existing natural conditions of the flow of traffic so that that more concerning traffic flow um, is, isn't being generated, or caused, or impacted by just a few people working in an office. Um, and the hours will probably not even necessarily overlap with the natural flow of the school system. Uh, this, that, I, my, <laughs> dropping off my kid, picking him up from school as well, uh, it is a chaos mess, uh, absolutely, all over the place. Um, but the addition of just a few more turning motions into the chaos mess, even if they overlapped, uh, wouldn't be significant. And um, maybe somebody from Amherst Media could say uh, the overflow parking situation, how often would an event like that occur? Not very often. I mean, one of the reasons that we were concerned. <laughs> Pen really likes you. One of the uh, reasons that this came up when we were first looking at the site, that we were doing the rotary auction every year which raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for the nonprofits in the schools, was where would that traffic go with that amount of people? Very seldom do we have a large event, but there is the possibility that we would like to know that if indeed, but we don't foresee that as a regular event happening. Thank you. We're not quite on to public comment yet. We'll get there very shortly. Thank you for that answer. Are you, oh, you're representing, yes. Did you have more information to add? If so, please join at the front. Um, one son who was graduated if you could please from the introduce high school. Yourself. I'm Demetria Shabazz. Thank you. I am the president of the board. Sorry. Um, so to speak to your concern, and I don't know if that will allay that, but our hours currently begin at 10 o'clock. And so that is after the rush hour in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, I have children in the school district as well, and I understand that problem that can occur anywhere in Amherst, but definitely our hours begin at 10 and then we close at 6. So it would be uh, after mm -hmm. and uh, of course after the, the rush hour in the afternoon. So to answer that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any more comments, questions from the board before we turn to public comments? All right, so we're going to take public comment now. There's three speakers I'm going to recognize before we turn to the general public, the first being Jennifer Taub of the Dickinson Local Historic District Commission. Please come to the front. Yes. Thank you. So, 
Um, I, uh, this is on, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Jennifer Taub, uh, the chair of the Amherst Local Historic District Commission, and I was just going <clears> to <throat> was asked to make a brief report on um, our meeting last week, and I do want to acknowledge that um, I appreciate Mr. Skinner. You know, Sparkle. Uh, Sparkle. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, say Mr. And yeah, Sparkle too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Sparkle. Sorry. Um, you know, uh, heard our comments and took them into consideration. So. Um, what I'm repeating, you know, has been acknowledged that, you know, it's been heard and um, that they're, you know, already moving forward on some of our recommendations. Uh, so um, at its March, 10, March 11th meeting, the local historic district commission uh, did vote unanimously four to zero on a motion um, not to grant a certificate of appropriateness for the building as it was currently proposed by Amherst Media Company. The commission um, was scrupulous in basing this decision on its mandated responsibilities as detailed in Article 8.2 of the Local Historic District Commission bylaw. I'll try and be brief. Uh, Section 8.2 states, in the case of new construction or additions to existing buildings or structures, the commission shall consider the appropriateness of the scale, shape, and proportions of the building or structure both in relation to the land upon which the building or structure is situated and in relation to the buildings and structures in the vicinity. The commission may in appropriate cases impose dimensional and setback requirements in addition to those required by applicable statute or bylaw. The LHD commission determined that the quality and design of the building as it was currently proposed um, at the March 11th meeting um, was not compatible with surrounding historic districts. Uh, we also deem that the scale and revised siting of the building on the property were not appropriate in relation to the land upon which the building is proposed to be situated and in relation to the buildings in the vicinity, um, especially in this case when the neighboring structures affected by the current proposal are such iconic historic properties as the Amherst Women's Club and the Henry Hills House. Given the location and scale of the project, the commission determined that special care must and should be taken. Therefore, the commission made uh, the following four recommendations to Amherst Media Company. Uh, we asked that they explore the possibility of moving the location of the building to the east side of the property, uh, that they consider lowering the ridge line of the building, that they um, examine alternative building forms that reflect um, the historic you know, pastoral setting on the north side of Main Street, and we ask that they retain a professional registered architect to design a building that uh, would be more suitable for such an important and significant space in town. Um, I did want to clarify that the Local Historic District Commission is not questioning Amherst Media Company's um, right to construct a building on the property. And in fact, we did encourage them to um, come back to the local historic district commission with a new application for a redesigned building and perhaps site configuration. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I'll recognize Felicity Hardy now. I'm an attorney in Springfield, and I represent Harmsway LLC, which is the owner of 38 Gray Street. I know that there are a lot of people here who want to speak uh, this evening. Um, so in anticipation of that, I've submitted written comments uh, to the planning board uh, for your consideration. Um, and I'd like to just address a couple of points that were made in my letter, uh, which I think um, uh, deserve a little bit more uh, time and attention, especially given the board's questions and Mr. Sparkle's presentation. Um, first, let me speak to the question of the size of the lot. Uh, Ms. Gray Mullen uh, raised the question of what is the lot size, and Mr. Sparkle indicated that the lot size is 24,010 square feet, as shown on the plan that was submitted to you. 
uh, that is in direct contradiction to um, a uh, second amended complaint that Amherst Community Television, Inc. filed in the Hampshire Superior Court against Mr. Guidera. Part of that lawsuit has to do with the question of whether or not Mr. Guidera misrepresented um, the size of the lot or persuaded Amherst Community Television not to do a survey. And in that um, lawsuit, Amherst Community uh, Television indicates that there was a taking of land by the town of Amherst for the creation of a bus stop and the um, complaint alleges that the taking narrows the Amherst media lots to a depth of only 90 to 95 feet. Now your site plan, the site plan that was submitted, indicates that the width of the lot is 106 feet. And yet this complaint indicates that the lots are actually much narrower. Um, if we were to credit what's stated in this complaint, it reduces the lot size by about 2,000 square feet. The resulting parcel would still probably be uh, large enough to meet with the, the minimum zoning requirement, but the point really is that the, that the site plan is not correct, at least if you judge it against the complaint that Amherst Community Television has filed with the Hampshire Superior Court. It can't, it can't be both ways. Either it's 24,010 square feet as represented in the site plan, or it's something less as represented in this complaint. The second point I'd like to make has to do with the second story of the building. Um, that's very important because if the second story is intended for some use, you would have to include the area of the second floor as part of the gross floor area in computing what the parking requirements are um, for the site. Right now, the parking requirements for the site have been based upon a, the square footage of the first floor, which is 4,080 square feet. Based on that, if you were not to include the area of the second story, then the parking that Amherst uh, Media has provided in this uh, site plan is there are enough spaces. But in the building plans that were submitted with the application, uh, Great Country Timber represents that in fact there is a plan to utilize the second floor for something else. In fact, Great Country Timbers plans um, contemplate the construction of an elevator. Well, you wouldn't need an elevator for the storage for storage space. So if this, this second floor is going to be used for something, it dramatically increases the requirements for the parking. It takes the uh, required parking uh, amount from about 14 spaces to something like 28 spaces. So it's, I think, critical for the planning board to investigate what the plan is uh, for the second floor, why are they designing the building uh, with an elevator. And we've already heard this evening that the parking, the parking is going to be insufficient for major events. It would certainly be, right now, the parking is very tight you have insufficient um, radius to maneuver uh, cars in and out of these parking spaces. That problem is only going to be worse if the second story is used. That's why the zoning regulations require the computation of the second floor in the parking requirements. And um, so my suggestion is that the planning board investigate that um, and evaluate whether or not the parking is going to be sufficient. Um, again, there are others who want to speak. My written remarks have been uh, submitted. Um, I noticed, I noted Mr. Levenstein's um, comments and questions about the traffic study. We would encourage that as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I'll now recognize Chris Chamberlain of Berkshire Design.
I'm Chris Chamberlain. I'm a professional engineer with Berkshire Design Group in Northampton. Um, I did submit a letter earlier today, which I apologize for the lateness of that uh, submission. I got uh, involved in this project only late last week, um, and as I'm sure Bucky can attest, uh, the civil engineering world is very busy these days. Um, so I've been uh, asked by the owners of 38 Gray Street to um, do an engineering review of the site plan, uh, which I've submitted some comments of uh, some issues that, that we've identified that uh, we would ask the board to uh, inquire um, on some uh, clarification on them. Uh, I understand uh, uh, Bucky has not uh, read that letter, so I wouldn't expect him to necessarily be ready to address those comments right now. Um, the, I do also want to say that you know this is a difficult site. As an engineer reviewing these plans, it's clear that a great deal of work has gone in to try to make a workable plan. Um, but there are some uh, issues and open questions that I'm left with uh, in reviewing the plan. And I just want to highlight a couple of them related to stormwater uh, that, again, are, are more fleshed out in the letter. Um, in looking at the stormwater calculations that analyze the proposed control system, which consists of a large detention basin. Uh, there are two uh, inputs of water uh, that are not accounted for in the calculation. Uh, in the drainage report, uh, the applicant uh, acknowledges that there is a large tributary area contributing water to the site from uphill. Um, they state that uh, it's not this project's uh, responsibility to manage that water, which is true. Uh, when we develop a site, we need to uh, mitigate the impacts that we create, but we don't need to solve every problem in the world. Um, however, in the analysis of the detention basin, uh, that water is treated as if it were bypassing the system, when in fact it is entering the system and then being discharged. And that becomes very important because the way these detention systems work is it's a large volume to store that water, and it's a dynamic system. As more water is stored, the outflow from that basin increases. And so therefore, I can design a detention basin for a particular site that replicates the existing outflows from the site, but if I then load it with additional water coming in from off-site, it can change those dynamics such that the system no longer achieves the design goals. In the extreme case, uh, if there were a tremendously large area of water flowing into that detention basin, even if it's sized correctly for the postage stamp that I am developing, it could cause that basin to overflow to the point where it no longer attenuates uh, stormwater at all. I am not claiming that that is necessarily the case. I haven't analyzed uh, the system accounting for that upstream water, but uh, our recommendation to the board is that they ask the applicant to look at how that upstream water flowing into the detention basin affects the dynamics of that system. And similarly, we note that there are a number of drains to remove groundwater from the site, which is an appropriate design. Uh, everyone out there understands that high groundwater is an issue. There is a footing drain surrounding the building. There's also a sub-drain uh, along the north side of the building <laughs> intended to intercept that groundwater as it's entering the site and prevent it from causing problems. All good things to add to the site plan. However, those, that groundwater is then discharged into the infiltration basin uh, that makes up part of the system. And uh, we know uh, from the drainage report that the soils are relatively fine, meaning they're very slow to infiltrate uh, water to groundwater. Um, and so if the flow of groundwater from those pipes is high enough, water can actually build up in that infiltration basin to the point where it could be full when a storm comes, which would then reduce the ability of that system to manage stormwater. Um, so again, the, the recommendation that we're making to the board is to ask the applicant to try to quantify what that groundwater contribution is and whether it impacts the functioning of the system and what the results are um, if that is uh, accounted for. Um, and then finally, uh, the stormwater standards that Bucky referenced uh, do require infiltration um, to be attempted to sort of return that volume of water back into the earth that we've blocked by creating um, pavement and buildings. And uh, an analysis has been done in the stormwater report uh, that shows what that infiltration system will do. 
Um, one of the other requirements in the stormwater standards is to do what's called uh, a mounding analysis, which it, the exact details of that are technical and we don't need to talk about them right now. But the concept is that if you take a volume of water uh, and intend to soak it into the ground, it has a tendency to raise the groundwater in an isolated area right underneath that infiltration. If that sort of, that mound of water increases enough to the point where it touches the bottom of the infiltration basin, uh, it can actually dramatically um, reduce the ability of that water to be discharged. Um, and uh, given the separation between the infiltration basin and the groundwater table, the stormwater standards do require that that mounting analysis be done. And given the, the soils on the site, uh, it's my opinion that it would be appropriate to do so. Um, so those are, again, very technical issues. Uh, I do understand that, that the town engineer reviewed the plan and had no comments on the stormwater system. I, my opinion is I'm, I'm surprised that that was the conclusion, um, but I also haven't had any conversations with the town engineer. I haven't read his letter, um, so I don't necessarily have an opinion um, on that uh, on its own, but um, uh, I would, uh, I've also copied this letter to the town engineer, so he may or may not have um, comments uh, to my statements. Thank you. I'm Charlene Moran. I'm the president of the Amherst Women's Club. Uh, and I'd like to present our perspective on the Amherst Media building. In 2017, Amherst Media came to the Amherst Women's Club and presented plans for their development of the land bordering Main and Gray Street. But this original plan in no way reflects what Amherst Media is currently attempting to get past and build in the Emily Dickinson Historic District. Not only has the building design been fancied up in an inappropriate style, but the location, scope, and uh, height, especially, of the building has changed significantly, placing it in proximity of and in the direct sight line of the Hills Memorial Clubhouse, which is the home of the Amherst Women's Club. As many of you may know, the Amherst Women's Club is a civic organization that has served the community for 125 years. We are proud of our commitment and annual contributions to local community service agencies and scholarships to Amherst Regional High School seniors. And we are proud of being in the National Historic Register and situated in the Emily Dickinson Historic District. We use those two distinctions in all of our uh, uh, literature. In order to maintain the Hills Memorial Clubhouse, we work very hard to fundraise and to open our beautiful mansion to the public for a variety of events, including weddings, memorial services, conferences, lectures, musical programs. All of this, <clears throat> excuse me, allows us to keep the house in good condition and fulfill our legacy of caring for this beautiful property as we have been able to do for 125 years. Many of the events we have, especially large public events, are held on the porch and in the gardens <clears throat> on the side of the house. According to what we understand from the proposed size, height, and proximity to our gardens and mansion, this three-story building will have a negative impact on our ability to rent our property for revenue to maintain the mansion. In addition, by any stretch of the imagination, a barn would never be created and appear in front of such beautiful historic homes. This building seems in no way appropriate for the sliver of land that sits on the road and will obscure the view and value of the two historic mansions behind it. While we support immensely the work and mission that Amherst Media embodies, this building will forever change the Emily Dickinson Historic District and our place in it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, back left, on the left. Hello, 
thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Jessica Wilkinson. Uh, I and my family live at 20 Gray Street. We are one of the abutters. Um, when these lots proposed, were first proposed for rezoning in 2013, specifically, they were proposed specifically to allow for the construction of Amherst Media's new home. And when they were presented to town meeting, when this proposal for the rezoning was presented to town meeting, the schematic drawings were shown to that body, to town meeting. And I noticed that they're on the back there. I also have a copy of the schematic drawings that were shown to town meeting at the time. Those drawings were of a 22,700 square foot building. It was a two-story building. It was located on the lot at the corner of Gray and Main. And the building itself was architecturally consistent with that of other historic structures in the area. Most importantly, uh, the proposal that was put forth before town meeting showed a building on the lots that would have left the view of the Hills House and the Amherst Women's Club unimpeded from Main Street. Town meeting supported the rezoning petition, largely, I believe, because of its dedication to the laudable mission of Amherst Media and its trust that the development would remain historically appropriate. The project now presented to us uh, shares nothing in common with that shared with town meeting. As now planned, it would stand directly in front of the Hills House. It would be three full stories, 32 feet tall, and it would impede the view of both the Hills House and the Women's Club from Main Street. I appreciated the um, angles that were shown, but we also show, showed, uh, were shown pictures of three 20, 12 foot high um, trees that were going to block this property also. So I'm not sure how we reconcile those two things. Uh, the structure itself um, is a Dutch colonial with a gambrel roof, a barn style building designed not by an architect, but by an engineer. And it's clearly, clearly incongruous with the historical setting. Again, originally a 2,700 foot square building. And what we just learned is that the current building is over 4,000 feet. And that just takes into account the first floor only, which is what I, what I just heard. It's very concerning. Um, as you know, last week, the Dickinson Historic District Commission unanimously denied Amherst Media its request for an application for appropriateness. The commission also passed a resolution with four recommendations that were already shared with you. Uh, but to repeat, to move the building to the eastern corner of the site, to lower the height of the building considerably, to consider alternative forms that reflect the historic setting, and to hire an experienced architect to design a building more consistent with the pastoral landscape of the district. Um, and as I understand it, this body, the planning board, um, operates under a set of bylaws and that you must follow a set of criteria when reviewing uh, site plan reviews and when undertaking a site plan review. Uh, there are principles and standards set forth in the bylaws, um, including uh, to mandating you to ensure that buildings avoid, to the extent feasible, impacts on scenic views. This is clearly a scenic view that we are considering today. In addition, because the property is zoned business neighborhood and was, is within the boundaries of a national historic register district, the bylaws state that if the planning board deems the proposal likely to have a significant impact on its surroundings, it is permitted to use the design principles and standards set forth in section 3.2040 uh, of the bylaws. Um, this project, uh, clearly would have significant impacts on its surroundings and as such I urge the planning board to adhere to those principles and standards and in particular and this is paraphrased from those bylaws I urge the board to make every reasonable effort to preserve the historical landscape of this area to consider the relationship on the site of this property to surrounding open space and to modify the scale of the project to ensure that it's compatible with the surrounding architecture and historical landscape <coughs> to be clear I don't think any development residential, commercial, or under ownership of any owner, whether it be a nonprofit organization, Amherst Media, or someone else, would be appropriate on the lot in front of the Hills House that were any, any area of that that would impede the sweeping views of the historic home on Main Street. I am sympathetic to the challenges that Amherst Media faces related to building on the corner lot, but I do not think this town should have to compromise an invaluable historic treasure to compensate for a lack of due diligence on the part of Amherst Media. It's very clear there are considerable design problems and site problems with <coughs> particularly the corner lot that if the Amherst Media had done its due diligence from the start, would have easily been able to find that out. 
Um, so in conclusion, I urge the planning board to utilize its authorities under the bylaws to deny this project and to commit to denying any project in this location that does not conform to all four recommendations set forth by the Historic Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment. Yes, back left. Michael Hankey, 91 Great Street, and I did serve on the Historical Commission for nine years, and I was on the Design Review Board for six. I was debating whether I was going to speak tonight or run home and do a mounding test in my backyard, but I've elected to stick around and speak. Uh, I do support uh, Amherst Media Building here. However, I think they should adhere to the, uh, to the requirements of the site. It's a difficult site. I think the, uh, the linchpin here is parking. I think they should really investigate looking across the street to the Spanish Center or across Main Street uh, for some parking alternatives and eliminate most of the parking on the site. And I think that'll solve a lot of the problems. When the lumberyard was there, they had to negotiate with the parking lot in the back because they had no parking whatsoever and they had a much greater use than Amherst Media is going to have in terms of traffic. So I've prepared a, a statement, although I completely agree with, and I'll go through this quickly. Although I completely agree with and wholeheartedly support the mission of Amherst Media and their desire to build their new headquarters on the corner of Gray and Main Streets, I'm concerned about the appropriateness of its proposed building. I agree that this is a great location for Amherst Media, but with this location comes the responsibility to create a structure that is in visual harmony with the most important historic neighborhood in Amherst, the Emily Dickinson Local Historic District. Amherst Media's new headquarters will occupy the gateway to this historic district. A barn of this proposed type would never have been built there in the past, given the location and history of the property, nor would it fit in harmoniously today. Type in the term barn logo in your web browser and select the images tab to see the results. The proposed structure is a stereotypical red barn hip roof on the gable ends with cupolas. Of course, now it's white. The design for this location is to play nicely with the three late 19th and 20th century white houses that march up Gray Street from this lot, two 19th century mansions that reside behind it, and a late 19th century house and brick commercial building that sit across Main Street. The one thing I learned tonight that wasn't clear in the uh, rendering is context. The proposed building will sit at the highest point on that lot, and um, it will, it's in the center of the whole block. So by virtue of being in the center, it's, it's gained in prominence and will be the main feature you see for Main Street. A barn-like form is not incompatible with this location, but it needs to be simpler, dispensing with the hip roof gables and multiple cupolas. It could be a modern take on a vernacular barn. This would be a graceful gabled roof form, sheathed in clapboard with its walls, punctuated carefully, placed casement windows and doors. Might be painted white or off-white to relate to its neighbors on Gray Street. A good architect, and I'm stressing that, a good architect, not just any architect, a good architect, could create such a design and should be engaged before moving the project forward. That would solve a lot of problems. Whatever design was ultimately proposed, it had to be reviewed by the local historic district commission, which it was. I had hoped that Amherst Media would have reconsidered their chosen design prior to submitting it to the commission. The submission also included the presentation of construction documents for a completed design and ignored the customary process of first submitting and presenting a conceptual design followed by a more developed design. Very difficult for people to understand, uh, essentially, contract documents. Amherst Media's presentation materials are very hard for most in attendance to understand and were created as blueprints for contractors as a guide to complete the site work and to actually construct the building. They should produce renderings that show the building in context as well as including any landscaping. I was a member of the Historical Commission when the Hills Mansion property was subdivided by Barry Roberts and ultimately sold to Mr. Cadera. <coughs> At that time, either Mr. Roberts or Mr. Gadera could have sold the two Main Street lots to the town of Amherst, but that did not happen. I believe that if Amherst Media is sincerely committed to building a structure that could meet the standards set forth by the local historic district committee, this project would move through the process much more smoothly or as smoothly as is possible in Amherst. Let's face it, it's never going to be totally smooth. Uh, Many people devoted countless hours to creating the Emily Dickinson Historic District. In doing so, they created a bulwark against any new structure or modification to existing structures that would negatively, negatively impact the landscape. As far as I know, a certificate appropriate of appropriateness is required prior to moving forward with a project in the district, regardless of what any other board, commission, or town staff might agree to or approve. 
This is one of the reasons the local historic district was formed, and uh, I was a big advocate of it because on the historical commission we had virtually no power. People, <coughs> general residents didn't understand that we were powerless unless the planning board or uh, the zoning board of appeals would ask us for input and then they could enforce it. The Emily Dickinson Local Historic District Committee was unanimous uh, in not approving this, and we already know that. To help Amherst Media, I sent them the name of an architecture firm that's located in Western Mass but has never done any work in Amherst. They have no baggage and are one of the best firms in the state. They also have specialized in the kind of architecture that would fit in beautifully at this site and have designed several wonderful and successful contextual commercial buildings in Williamstown, Massachusetts. I strongly suggest that Amherst Media contact and engage them or another good architect to design the exterior uh, of their new building to help move this thing forward. That would put them in a much stronger position to achieve their goals. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comments. Yes, back row. Hi. Uh, my name is Nico Gadera. Uh, I'm in a butter, um, and I, uh, I have interest in uh, two of the properties uh, uh, nearby. Uh, first, uh, I would like to um, say that I'm a fan of Amherst Media. I like the, what they do. Uh, I believe in, uh, in the work that they're doing. Um, also, that uh, there is a letter, uh, an email that was submitted by one of my brothers, by Chris Gadera, as representative of Barbara Gadera Realty Trust and the Gadera Realty Trust. <clears throat> I don't speak for them. Uh, I speak for myself as a, as a neighbor. Um, I would like to point out uh, a couple of things. Uh, the use of the building itself, uh, with having a second floor and uh, what may be uh, commercial media production, I'm not sure, but perhaps more than just uh, educational. Uh, and that educational itself means more than just five staff members, I believe, uh, that would be going in and out, uh, plus the uh, uh, the, uh, I believe it was four, mem four board members that, uh, that was mentioned. Uh, and the fact that they've asked for overflow parking at the VFW uh, tells me or you know, makes me wonder what the actual eventual use will be of the space, especially with that second floor. So um, as somebody mentioned before, I would uh, like to have that looked into a little bit further, if possible. Um, in terms of the shape of the building itself, uh, I did uh, mention in front of the uh, Historic Commission that it is something that's more appropriate to a farm-like uh, area. Um, and finally, I would like to address the, uh, what was mentioned uh, before uh, about the dynamics of how Amherst Media buying the lots actually allowed uh, my mother to buy uh, 14 Gray Street and then for my brother Jerry to uh, uh, build and fix up the Hills House, you know, that's horribly misstated, and I would like to uh, just say that that's completely incorrect. And that's it. Thank you so much. Additional public comment. Yes, sir, in the blue. Ed Wilford, 48 Gray Street. The hydrological problem of this property is, I think, by now evident to you all. The question, the further question is that it is a dynamic situation. The original holding of the water in, in the hill uh, had the advantage of trees both uh, on the common line between the two hills properties and on Gray Street. And the moving of the buildings uh, at 14 and then the next building up also impacted, changed the situation there. But since then, we, we could expect that the situation, the hydrological situation, would have, have come to a stasis. But in fact, the last two years, in the springtime, we have had a, a flood down the main street sidewalk coming out of the hill. And this fall, we have had water 
out on Main Street, uh, flowing down Main Street, uh, a good uh, uh, one car's width, and ice after uh, it froze uh, out again on Main Street at the corner of Gray Street. Is this something that is not going to get any worse, or is it something that's going to get worse? In which case, it might eventually doom the viability for Amherst Media on this property. And that is my fear that, that they should, somewhere down the line, find that the hydrological problem is insoluble. And then if they have to sell the building and won't find a buyer easily for it, we have a situation that deteriorates further. I have been a supporter of, of Amherst Media. I believe in what they're doing, but I'm afraid that they are biting off more than they can chew in this particular site and would encourage them to do something in co cooperation with the town on, on a site that doesn't have this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Yes, sir, on the right. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. My name is Barry Simon, and, and uh, I live on Dickinson Street. I've lived there for about 30 years. And I just want to talk about the architecture for a moment. Dickinson, that whole Dickinson area is kind of a funky area, and there were some buildings that were built maybe in the, the 20s and 30s that are kind of odd. But they add to the character of the neighborhood. And in the 30 years that I've been there, I've watched that neighborhood go from really funky to great character and, and quite beautiful. People have rebuilt houses with, without changing them, um, myself included. I've worked for 30 years on, on the, the house on Dickinson Street. And even Amherst College, when they bought Page Chevrolet Building, they did a really nice job with that building. It adds character to the neighborhood. You know, it's uh, maybe kind of... 1930s garage chic or something like that. And to see the architecture of a Gambrel, I don't want to denigrate it, but uh, a medical office building uh, architecture be plopped in the middle of really what is one of the most important architectural uh, spots in Amherst that has been and is still on its way up. It's, it's getting more elegant all the time. So I would hate to see it just, I mean, as someone said, uh, some architectural input uh, at the very least is called for in this. I mean, to put this building in that spot is uh, move backwards. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Additional comments? Uh, yes, yeah, second row on the aisle. My name is Robert Spicer. I live at 38 Gray Street, also referred to as the Henry Hills House. The project that the planning board is being asked to review is not the one that came before a town meeting in 2013. The planning board's report to that meeting stated that one of the benefits of rezoning the two lots on which Amherst Media proposes to build was that rezoning, quote, would allow more flexibility in terms of preserving the view from Main Street up to the Hills Mansion, close quotes. Assured that Amherst Media could build on the eastern lot, town meeting voted in favor of the rezoning. Building on the eastern lot is not Amherst Media's plan. Instead of preserving the view, they're proposing a building from the western lot directly in front of the Henry Hills house and obscuring the view of the Amherst Women's Club from the east. This makes their presentation to the planning board and 2013 town meeting 
seems somewhat disingenuous, like a bait and switch. Another bait and switch is to come. The plan that is being presented at tonight's meeting of the planning board is going to be changed again. Amherst Media announced in a March 18th email blast that in response to the local historic district commission's rejection of the plan, they will, quote, they will present a redesign. How can the planning board be asked to approve a plan that does not yet exist? After Amherst Media bought the two lots, it became apparent that they had made a bad deal. They, sa they said so when they sued the seller, first in land court and then in superior court. The case is uh, Amherst Community, Community Television versus Gadera. They asserted that they had overpaid for the land, which, was worth not, which they said was worth not more than $290,000, not $400,000, and that it was unbuildable. Indeed, it might be, but they proposed to build anyway. This will shift the cost of their bad deal to the town by destroying the character of the surrounding area. It will also entail enormous additional construction costs because of the constraints of a historic district and the drainage requirements that they claim not to have discovered until years after they bought the property. The Superior Court noted that a higher standard of due diligence is statutorily required of a not-for-profit, which is buying property, and that Amherst Media did not meet that standard. The town of Amherst, which provides the great majority of Amherst Media's funding, bore the cost of overpayment for unbuildable property. We are being asked to continue to pay for their malfeasance through unnecessary construction costs and destruction of the very vistas that their presence was intended to preserve. The same March 18th email refers to Amherst Media's right quote, right to build, close quotes. All property owners have a right to build, but that right is subject to the rules, regulations, and guidelines established by the town and the boards that are charged with carrying out its policies. It is alarming that Amherst Media goes on to say that, quote, we are interested in reflecting the nature of both the cultural and historic districts, however, we are determined to build on our property as would any other owner in the town of Amherst. Any other owner in the town of Amherst is also subject to the decisions of our town boards. The determinations of the local historic district commission and the planning board are not mere suggestions. Their findings govern the way that we run this community. And it's time for Amherst Community Television to recognize the meaning of its middle name. Its apparent willingness to run roughshod over community standards is very disappointing for an organization that does so much for the town by way of its programming. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comments. Yes, right on the back. <coughs> Hello, good evening. Um, thanks for this opportunity. I'm not as eloquent of a speaker as everybody else, so I'll be short and sweet. Um, my name is Kay Gregory. I live on Newell Court. Uh, and while I don't abut the site, my neighbors do, and I feel like I use the site every day. I walk the neighborhood, I walk my dog. I also own a business on Main Street that faces Dickinson Street. Um, and this proposed building, or frankly, any building on this site will change the landscape forever. And I would argue that the landscape is just as big a part of the historical context as a building. And I think that we forget to talk about that sometimes. So I really hope that the Planning Commission and the Historic Commission will think about this carefully before rubber stamping another big soulless building in town. What is so wrong with leaving some green space? Thanks. Thank you so much. Is there further public comment? Yes, please. Yeah. My name is Mindy Sonner. Um, I own a building on Dickinson Street, which I designed and built. Uh, I'm an architectural designer and an interior designer. I own a design business in downtown Amherst. I've lived in the town since 1993. Um, 
I've been really shocked tonight by what is the driving factor of this, of the design of this building. Um, it seems like the first consideration is we have a lot, it's rectangular, it's right on Main Street, we don't have very much depth, we've got a water problem, um, we need this many parking spaces, we need this much height, we need this many square feet, and after all of those needs are met, this is what we're proposing. A building in an inappropriate spot, a building of inappropriate height, a building that is architecturally inappropriate, built of inappropriate materials. We're going to put a parking lot right on Main Street, right in front of architecturally significant buildings, and then we're going to put it's a strip mall building gussied up as a barn in front of those historically significant buildings. <clears throat> in order to make that building less onerous to the historical buildings surrounding it, we're going to put up a line of arbor vitae. It's the low rent solution to provide sightline privacy. We're going to use lighting that would have been used in a 1960s New Jersey development, and we're going to call it historical. I just can't believe that this is what's come in front of us tonight, no architect involved. In that site, the first and foremost consideration should be how do we preserve the historical significance of that beautiful space in Amherst? And that has to come first. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any further public comments? Uh, yes, sir. My name is Emil Shabazz. I live at 29 Chapel Road, what has sometimes been known and presented as the Judge Judy House. Um, the question of history is one that moves me to uh, say a word tonight. Um, and along with that word of history is the word democracy. Um, so as we all know, although some speakers felt the need to continue to assert uh, otherwise that a request to vote, a plan uh, has not been requested for tonight. Um, and that input and feedback would be heard and utilized uh, in presenting a plan. And I think that is the beauty of, of democracy, of these uh, processes that Amherst um, was a, a part of settlements that uh, that advanced this kind of uh, of, of democratic decision making and, and processes. But on the aspect of uh, the history, I think that's very important to preserve. However, um, some of the uh, notions, uh, low rent and running roughshod, and some of the emotive a language that we might be moved to speak about this process of trying to build a site uh, for an important organization like Amherst Media uh, must not cloud your thinking. What I think uh, is important for the planning board relative to its mandate is really to look at the wonderful opportunity that you have to give guidance to a process of the planning of the use of this very, very special site in the heart of Amherst. I think the democratic nature of Amherst Media covering this meeting tonight, uh, as it does other meetings and other activities of our town, of the culture of our town, speaks to its commitment to being at the heart of the town of Amherst. And so I really uh, hope if, uh, th that this can remain a compatible site for that 
eye on the heart of Amherst could, and voice of the heart of Amherst could be in the heart of Amherst. I really hope that your work can lead to a successful outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, back row in the red. Good evening. My name is Jacqueline Smith Crooks and I live on 186 Bay Road. I hesitated to come up here and I had not prepared a formal speech as my profession as a clergy person would indicate I should. I have a background in education. I'm an alum of the University of Massachusetts, a returnee to this area after having been away some close to 20 or 30 years. And I came here because of what Amherst offers, what it offered my family when we lived here back in the 70s and early 80s. And it was access to a wide range of educational opportunities, cultural opportunities. And, and when I came back, I came back with a passion for a bit more than I took when I left here after getting my doctorate. I have a passion for both the historical and the future. And I felt that when I, when I embarked on a journey with Amherst Media, I had made that connection in more ways than one. Because I began to see not only what I had experienced when I was here from 78 to 85, but I began to see something that allowed me to look to the future. I have had many contacts with young people from the area colleges who assisted me in gathering some historical information because of my passion for history. And it, it, it rises not just, even though I honor the buildings, history comes alive in so many other ways. And Amherst Media has offered me and so many others access to that rising futuristic notion of what constitutes history. I would hope that the committee, the planning board, and Amherst media are able to come to a meeting of the minds because the location of this building is so critical, not just to people who are residents of Amherst, but students in the surrounding colleges. And I don't think it could be a better place. I'm not an architect, and I, I can't give you uh, rationales and reasons for that. But as an educator, as one who has a passion for history and cultural connections, I strongly support the location of the Amherst Media. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any further public comments? All right, seeing none, we're gonna give the applicants some time to respond, then turn to questions and comments from the board. All right, thank you. Uh, I promise this will be a good deal shorter than the last time I was here. Going through these notes um, that I've collected, uh, I'll offer some extemporaneous rebuttals, uh, leave a few things for uh, the future. We don't have to get it all wrapped up tonight, I believe, so uh, I'm not gonna go off on any tangents. Uh, we have heard an awful lot, uh, as expected, about architectural details. Um, and as indicated by um, our uh, associates, I guess, at the Local Historic District Commission, we are working on that, and we'll be back with something that looks different. I can't say how, I'm not that guy. Uh, but w this is something that we're uh, acutely aware of. Um, in terms of the uh, comments from uh, the other engineer from Berkshire Design, a firm that I respect very much, uh, whose work I have also reviewed. Uh, uh, 
there, there are some things that they brought up, uh, all of which actually were part of my design and consideration, but I would like a little more time uh, to provide technical responses there. Um, but none of it was a surprise, fortunately, because the pit of my stomach drops out when an engineer comes up and says, you forgot this. So, uh, so I feel good about the work uh, in terms of the technical side. Uh, there were uh, a few uh, references to uh, the time that this land was converted in terms of zoning, uh, references to plans and schematic drawings. Uh, I do happen to have a copy, uh, say a couple of things that um, these were not promulgated by Amherst Media. I think we've heard tonight that they were, that's not the case. The plans themselves uh, were by F.R. Wilson and uh, not they are also uh, dedicated for the CCCS offices. I have no idea who they are, but that's not Amherst Media, but that's what their plan says. Uh, the drawing also shows uh, a three-story building, not a two-story building. Actually, it's three-story plus some kind of basement with um, garden windows. So uh, effectively, it is uh, quite, quite a tall structure. It is not scaled, but uh, it would be at least as tall as the building that is proposed, if not taller. Um, so there may be some inaccuracies of what was represented. Um, and certainly I cannot speak to what previous owners uh, would have said at meetings to the town uh, some years ago, uh, but it was an Amherst Media that changed the zoning. Uh, they benefited from the result thereof, of course, uh, to pave the way for the current application. And let's see, um, uh, there has been some degree of consideration for parking in other areas that we have been in contact with the VFW for overflow parking. Uh, the parking is mandated by zoning bylaw. Uh, even if there was just one person working in this office, we would still need as many parking spaces as we provided just because of the size of the building. Um, if there are other options, we would consider them, absolutely, and maybe we'll look a little further into that. Uh, one of the options is across the street is also owned by the Gadara family, uh, who hasn't been particularly friendly to the proposal despite that family selling us the land. There have been some issues. Uh, there's comments about the drawings being construction level documents. Um, as far as the civil site drawings go, this is just what is needed to get through the permitting process in Amherst uh, to make it as smooth as possible. And uh, as far as the building drawings, I think uh, maybe a little more development has gone into those drawings, uh, partially to accelerate the timeline uh, of the, the construction we were hoping uh, to be building uh, sometime in this year. Uh, and I've been on this since 2019, so, uh, you know, and that is certainly the, the purview of the, the client. If they want to go ahead and put a little more time and energy into, into the design process, it certainly does not help, hurt, rather, it does not hurt an application to have more information available. Uh, at some point, the, the educational mission of the facility uh, was challenged to a degree, um, but then later we've also heard that uh, this is very much an educational facility uh, and uh, hopefully it would be located uh, quite closely to uh, the, the college areas, Amherst College and UMass. Uh, there were questions about uh, water problems, hydrologic problems as they were referred to in regards, of, in regards to flooding and ice. Uh, that crosses the sidewalk. We are aware of this, uh, and actually, the uh, one of the things that has been incorporated into the design is the excess uh, of water that is draining, quite literally, from the Henry Hills House, from the Amherst uh, Women's Club. There are uh, actually drainage structures right now that are scheduled to be rerouted as soon as this project uh, is uh, enacted uh, to uh, stop a great deal of the flow of that water. Um, of course, if this project doesn't happen, that rerouting will not happen, so that problem will, won't be solved immediately. Uh, additionally, 14 Gray Street has uh, the abutter to the north. Uh, uh, French drains and other underground water uh, conveyance systems that discharge water to this site, so a great deal of the wetness uh, is considered in this design, and it will be ameliorated by this design. Uh, I would even go so far as eliminated by this design. It's one of the reasons that we're adding a cutoff drain. I normally wouldn't do that, because we already have the footing drains and that's enough. But even though we're reworking rather the neighbors, 
are reworking their own water discharge situation in conjunction with approved plans by the town uh, to send it directly to Gray Street via a pipe, a new pipe. Uh, we, we still want to um, you know, be, be on guard against the water, so to speak. So we're potentially a little over-designed. So, but we, we very much would like to see the, the water issue and the ice issue eliminated. Um, uh, there was talk about, uh, this, uh, this is sort of linear orders, I got it. Um, so going back to the zoning that there was assurances given that Amherst Media would be building on the east side of the property at the time that the zoning, rezoning occurred. Uh, it was, there were different parties involved in that. Amherst Media was not the owner. It was not their plan. It's not their name on the plan. It's not their name on the building. So those, those don't really ring true. Um, and uh, then of course we heard a few things in support of the project uh, as well as uh, the, the process that we are now all engaged in. Uh, and I fully concur with that. I, I really like to approach these things as uh, uh, back and forth problem solving. Uh, there are always in any project a great number of interests. Never are they aligned. So the board you know, and other entities in the town get to have, uh, I guess, what was it, the opportunity to help guide the process. And uh, I can speak on behalf of my client saying that they are more than willing to take the input from the board, take the input from the community, and do the best that they can, uh, meeting the site requirements and their other internal requirements, and provide a project that uh, will satisfy the greatest number of people where certainly not everybody will be satisfied. Um, we're doing the best we can. So uh, that's the end of my, uh, my comments on the comments. Uh, so next phase, please. Thanks so much. So given that the applicant has requested we continue this hearing and that there is additional material that is going to be submitted, it seems to me that that is likely the outcome. Are there board members that think that rather than that, a approval or denial is in order for this evening? So. Given that, it seems we're on track to continue the public hearing. I think we should do our best to make a list of homework for the applicant. Um, much has been provided already by public comment uh, as far as questions that we'd like to see addressed. So we could take this time for the board to mention any other material they would like to see or concerns they might have. Maria? I just want to say I so appreciate everything that has been presented tonight. Um, I truly believe Amherst Media will do everything that they can to make this project work for this site. I do feel like other groups have said, and this may sound self-serving because I am an architect, but you really need for this sensitive of a site, someone who looks at the whole project very holistically for the sensitivity of the adjacent parcels, the view sheds, everything that's been said tonight basically. You really need a bigger picture designer to look at this. It, it's such a great project and opportunity and location. That's my biggest sort of first big picture input. The second might just be maybe get a 3D model built of what you're proposing just to test it yourself and see if it is something you imagine that it would look like. I have a feeling that these sort of abstracted elevations that are very flat and put onto a flat site aren't actually revealing as much as you think you know, you're envisioning that this building is doing to where this, this building is being situated on the site. That might actually help you. Um, I really look forward to seeing future revisions because I, I really want to see this project happen. I just think that it's not a matter of just tweaking the barn, as everyone's been suggesting. I think it's taking a step back and really looking at this site and seeing where other opportunities, what the challenges are, and make them into opportunities because that's what designers do. I, I highly suggest finding someone that can help you do this because it is a great site. There are very important parcels adjacent. I mean, everything that's been said tonight over and over is just you need someone to really look at it from a bigger perspective. And uh, Maria, I would second all the recommendations you made. I was going to suggest that we see um, to supplement the type of rendering we've seen already, elevations that show the topography and site improvements. Uh, I don't believe there's a height mentioned for some of the vegetated screening elements, such as the arbor vitae. So if we could see some heights for those included on any future landscape plan, I would echo Maria's sentiments in encouraging you to consider engaging the services of an architect and perhaps a landscape architect. 
um, the issue of the uh, second floor gross area and use, I'd like to see a little bit more detail on. Lot size verification. Uh, was the registered land surveyor engaged to produce the documents we see before us and their stamp is on it? Yes. Uh, any further information on the VFW parking arrangement, whether that be the formal agreement or just some more elaboration on what you plan would be appreciated. That's the list that I had. Anything else from other board members? Jack? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we've heard a lot from uh, the people in attendance here, and, and obviously, uh, we, we're not, I don't feel like the planning board is going to work in a bubble here. We want to work with the decision by the uh, local historic uh, district commission as well. And um, they had those four points. And, you know, one of one, the tough one that you uh, went over, um, uh, Bucky, was the inability to put the building on the east side of the lot. And um, I have some uh, thoughts with regard to control of groundwater there. And if you've really looked at um, the ability to use uh, drains, uh, curtain drains, perimeter drains, to lower the water table, and and because I do feel you have a right to remove as much groundwater uh, as you can uh, to the stormwater system, um, and, and you can have conversations with with uh, Jason Skills, uh, the engineer on that uh, as well. But um, I did speak with them today and. Uh, I think it's important that you really take a, a good look and see what you can do in terms of groundwater control um, and be able to put the building uh, over there. But, uh, you know, the, you, the stormwater system, uh, is, you, you're putting groundwater or you're putting water back in the ground, but, you know, it's not, it's not wastewater, it's, just, it's stormwater. Uh, you should be able uh, to lower the groundwater. It's clean water that's being discharged and then at uh, I think at, at some point the groundwater will, will stabilize and, and that'll be uh, a situation that would be controlled. The other thing that I think you really should consider is looking at permeable uh, pavement, uh, either uh, blocks or you know, just the normal asphalt, which is a little more expensive. But my gosh, that will, you know, I think that'll be a, a huge uh, savings in terms of the storage volume that you're looking at. Um, with regard to that curtain, though, you also would be mitigating the problems uh, that are upgrading from uh, the runoff from, from, from your abutters. Um, but you're going to do, I understand you're going to do uh, another design and, uh, uh, you know, look forward to uh, seeing that. But you, you definitely, I, I think those four points from the local historic district need to be uh, addressed and also I just want to say that it is it is important that the the 2012 uh, rezoning was based on a conceptual and I understand how you know that was approved it's not it wasn't your building but I think that's was the idea that the community had and so I think that's uh, obviously has come up several times uh, uh, today, so I, I, I respect that as well, uh, of how that got rezoned in the first place. Thanks, Jack. I also want to point out in our packets we have a development application report prepared um, by staff, and that addresses a number of issues, points out some issues, I should say. And I believe most or all of them have been addressed either by the presentation by the applicant or by our request for additional information, with the exception of a suggestion that we may wish to require the submission and approval of a construction logistics plan and that the board may also wish to consider requiring additional details on the signs that are proposed. If I could ask staff if there's any other issues that they might recommend that the board ask for additional information on. I can't think of anything right now. Thank you. Jack? Um, I was also intrigued uh, about the uh, potential for parking, off-site parking, and, and uh, I think it was Michael there that suggested it, that for employees, uh, is this a situation where we would grant a, a waiver for parking, uh, given that situation, if a, 
uh, offsite agreement is is in hand, and, and that would also, you know, again, help with the stormwater situation. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and the thought that if you're in that east corner, the height, I think, uh, probably is going to be less of an issue. You're going to have an elevator. Uh, I think it open, opens up, you know, opportunities for a multi-story building there. So, um, anyway, uh, I, I understand, uh, uh, I just want to say, you guys are doing a good job, I understand, and I, I can't believe the number of circumstances you guys are dealing with. So, um, I look forward to seeing you back here. Chris. I did have one thing that I wanted to say, which is to encourage the applicants to look at different planting materials. Instead of planting um, hedges of arborvitae, I know those act to um, screen buildings and screen uh, buildings from each other, et cetera, but it's really kind of a knee-jerk reaction, and um, there are more creative ways and more creative types of plants, and I'm sure Mr. Severance um, can come up with some, and if you were to uh, speak to a landscape architect, I think they could help you with that, too. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Additional comments, questions from the board? If not, I'd entertain a motion to continue the public hearing, and if I could, before that, ask uh, Chris if there's a date that would be good for that. Chris? I believe everyone is here on April 3rd. Is that correct? No. Oh. The next choice is April 17th, and then I think a couple of you aren't here on April 17th either. I'm likely not here on the 17th. So the next date would be a um, date in early May, which would be the first um, Wednesday in May. I'll have to figure out what that is. So if I could recap for April 3rd, so far there's only one member that will likely be absent? Two. Possibly could we get a bit more time? We're anticipating needing roughly two months to bring in. Oh, I'm sorry. That's yes. Unusually, again, unusually. Uh, if you could please use the mic oh, when you're, yes. thank you so much. Um, the, the process in bringing in the design professionals you're seeking, acquiring them takes a little time, them getting their teeth into the project and revising plans, getting it back to you. Uh, two months is sort of a minimum, I think, that we would need at this point. Uh, so if we could look, if we could look at uh, late May, that might smooth things over. Chris? So there, are there are three Wednesdays in May. There's the 1st, the 16th, and the 29th. 29th. The 15th, excuse me. The 1st, the 15th, and the 29th. Given the two months that was requested, the 29th would be the earliest, I believe. Is that workable for all members here? Okay. So that being the case, I'd entertain a motion to continue no. the... Oh, oh, oh. oh sorry. Wait, I'm, I'm getting not, some I'm new not information. Here. I'm not here at the 29th. All right, so we're down one. All right. Is everyone else available on May 29th? Check. 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 Yes. Okay. So that being the case, entertain a motion to continue the public hearing to May 29th. Move. Move, move that motion to continue the hearing. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you to Amherst Media. Thank you for the public for joining us. We'll be back here to discuss this further on May 29th. Chris. 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 I just wanted to be clear about who won't be here. Is that David? I'm not here on the 29th, May 29th. Okay. But I don't want to miss it. <laughs> you can always write a statement. <laughs> what am I need, you, jerk? <laughs> and you chaired that very well too. If folks could please orderly and quietly circulate out of the room, we do have some more business to attend to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
All right, so we're now going to turn to our 720 item. This is SPR 2019-03 Emily Dickinson Museum, 20 Triangle Street, and 280 Main Street. This is continued from March 6, 2019. They're requesting site plan review approval to convert a single family house to administrative offices for the Emily Dickinson Museum, a nonprofit museum and educational institution under sections 3.330.0 and 3.334 of the zoning bylaw, including site improvements to 20 Triangle Street and 280 Main Street for access and parking at map 14B, parcels 20 and 27. I'm just going to give staff and the applicant a little time to prepare their materials. Do you want the easel? We're just going to take maybe a two-minute break here. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome back. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and let us know the latest update on your project. Okay. My name is Tom Hartman, Goldman Hartman Architects, uh, representing the Dickinson Museum. Um, so since we met two weeks ago, there have been a couple of meetings. Um, I can report that the Amherst Disability Access Committee met again. Um, after providing an advisory p opinion on February 12th, and they voted not to allow the museum accessible parking in lieu of the accessible parking at 20 Triangle Street. So if you recall, we talked about not providing this access accessible space and using the space at the museum. So that was voted down um, in a subsequent meeting. So we are going to provide that uh, park, accessible parking space and there's no modifications proposed at the museum. I spoke with my client and as requested, a bike rack will be provided at the museum. Uh, the local historic district commission approved the project as proposed, including the removal of the Goshen stone wall. Uh, we received some comments from the abutter who met with uh, Ms. Brestrip, and our proposals are as follows. The van accessible space and access aisle will be located three feet to the south, so that the access aisle is at the bottom of the staircase. That'll provide a space of about three feet to the abutter's stone wall and should alleviate uh, concerns about door slamming in. Um, and we propose that that three foot space be seated with grass as there are plantings on the, on the other side of the abutter's property line. Um, there was a request to remove a spruce tree and two dead dogwoods, and that will be included in, in the project at an additional cost to the owner. And rather than modify the curb cut to avoid conflicting with the abutter's stone wall, which does per extend into the public way, uh, we propose that the portion of the wall extending into the public way simply be removed by the abutter. Here's a photograph of that. You can see here's the current apron. The right of way is about here. And I think that is the portion of the wall that is being hit by cars turning in or plows or whatever. So given it's a mere wall, I think it should just be eliminated rather than redoing the curb cut. Uh, the existing curb cut is fine. Uh, the shrub. That little fella right there will be removed as requested. And the driveway will be widened to 14 feet and we propose the existing hedges are to remain. 12 feet is required for an individual drive. And we have proposed this our alternate parking plan, which we will utilize some of the Goshen stone that's there and create a small retaining wall to provide three individual parking spaces in addition to the accessible parking space. And we will have a sign right there designating those three spaces as staff only. Any questions? Is the, the location of the bike rack indicated on a plan somewhere? No, it is not. It will be at the museum. Thank you. Chris? Will there be signage for the handicapped parking space? Yes, as required. David? What's the access into the building from that handicapped parking space? 
There is a walkway that comes around here, and then up this walkway into the accessible entrance. Jack? Um, I remember we had discussions on the stone wall, but I honestly don't remember uh, what was <laughs> what, what we uh, directed you to do, or if that's you know what what the status of that. The discussion was whether the stone wall would be required to remain by the local historic district commission, and if so, the implications of what that would be on the hedges, and the preference is to retain the hedge and remove the wall, which is our proposal. Thank you. And so if I understand correctly, the plan that's being proposed, as you said, has been approved and granted a certificate of appropriateness by the Historic District Commission? That is my understanding. Thank you. Other comments or questions from the board? It seems to me that you've addressed all the concerns we had last time, so I don't have a problem with approving this project as proposed. And if others don't, then I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing and grant uh, site plan review approval, finding that the project meets all the criteria of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw. Second. Oh, I would make or? Some, someone could I'll move make that. It okay. If you second it. Oh, I thought. Are you right. I, I, I move to it? approve <laughs> everything you just said. <laughs> I can't remember everything you just said. <laughs> and I'll second that. Great. That's moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Yes, Chris. Uh, <laughs> there were conditions listed in the previous set of minutes. Were those conditions acceptable in the set of minutes that you reviewed today? Yes, I found them acceptable. Did the motion maker and seconder find them acceptable? Could you please read the conditions? Chris, do you have them available? All exterior lighting shall be downcast and dark sky compliant. That's one. Um, two, if the local historic district commission recommends substantial changes to this project during its review, the applicant shall return to the planning board. I think you could eliminate that one. The applicant shall return to the public meeting to discuss with the board the possibility of providing a bike rack. Okay, so that you can eliminate that one. Landscaping shall be installed in accordance with site landscape plan and once installed shall be continually maintained that's kind of a standard one um, and then five I guess you could well this has to do with the AAB if the AAB architectural access board determines that no accessible parking space is required at 20 Triangle Street the applicant shall return to the planning board for review and approval but it sounds like the applicant has already decided based on what they heard from the DAAC that they would keep that accessible parking space so I think you can strike um, two and three and five. Which just leaves downcast lighting and maintenance of landscaping? Yes. And the bike Correct. rack. Does that right? And the bike rack. And the bike rack, which has already been proposed, yes. Great. Okay. Are those conditions amenable to mover and seconder? Great. All right. Further discussion? All in favor? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, moving on with our agenda. Um, we're now on to item four, planning and zoning. The zoning subcommittee reports and the zoning subcommittee met this evening. And we decided that we would take, um, we checked in as we often do about town council status and zoning and um, what their work plan is with zoning. We had heard previously the town council might want to hear about zoning from the planning board in the fall. And it was expressed to us that perhaps it would be beneficial to the town council to get their feet wet, per se, with zoning a little bit sooner than that. And so the zoning subcommittee has recently discussed bringing back one or more of articles which recently were proposed by the planning board and endorsed by the planning board but did not pass town meeting. And at the zoning subcommittee tonight, we decided that we would engage with the town council's newly formed community resources group on the topic of zoning in the near future and specifically talk about the potential to bring forth, again, the supplemental apartment article, which did not pass in spring of 2018, in part because uh, there was a sense that our government was in transition and perhaps this was not the correct time to address this article. So that article uh, would be one that we'll discuss, as will be 
a potential article to be drafted that would address issues with marijuana cultivation, which may be uh, currently being unduly restricted. Um, there's an issue where a marijuana use cannot be more than X, uh, less than X feet from a residential use, and uh, currently there's an interpretation in place that a driveway for a marijuana use is counted as part of the use. And so um, a potential uh, petitioner and staff and the zoning subcommittee will work on language for that. And finally, there's the potential, depending on how our discussion goes about planning board rules and regulations and the voting requirements, that the planning board would request the zoning bylaw be amended to change the voting requirements in line with our discussion. So the zoning subcommittee plans to be speaking to town council and their subcommittee about those things. The zoning subcommittee will next meet uh, in two weeks prior to the planning board meeting on April 3rd. There's no public present, so I imagine there's no public comment. Is there any uh, other issues on planning and zoning? Chris. This is um, not exactly on planning and zoning, but I just wanted to clear up that um, Ms. Gray Mullen and Mr. Jimsick will not be here on April 3rd. Is that correct? Great, thank you. Uh, moving on to old business, we've already addressed item 5A. Is there any old business topics not reasonably anticipated? Jack. Well, uh, I would just. Eat, uh, this was included in our packet. I, I thought that interest, uh, this article and Oh, we Blumenberg. actually have that for our next. Oh, oh that's on the agenda? Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, that the is that the apartment article? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. So uh, it looks like no old business topics not reasonably anticipated. New business, we do have a topic, which I think Jack was mentioning. Do you want to tell us sure. about that? Well, I would just sort of like we've done in the past, maybe just research it a little bit and just discuss it in a future meeting because I thought it was very curious that it's one of the major complaints of you know, you know downtown development is how they look, but it's just... Uh, and to it's, give it's, some background, could you just mention what the article is? Yeah, the article um, is uh, Why America's New Apartment Buildings All Look the Same. It's by Justin Fox. It was published in uh, Bloomberg.com and it's and it's pretty extensive but it, it looks it puts it in a context in terms of uh, why buildings are uh, you know have the size and structure and look uh, uh, that they do and then I guess there's only so much you can do with outside architecture given what they're trying to do inside with regard to I think fire uh, you know prevention wider halls uh, uh, available materials, affordability of, of construction materials, that sort of thing. So, yeah, so the, the money drives the look. Uh, but I just thought it was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ours everywhere. building, yeah, it's everywhere. So It was very interesting to see that kind of confluence of factors that leads to this very similar form you see all across the country. So I definitely think it's worth taking into consideration. Christine? And I just, they all are that four or five stories, you know, over and over again. So thanks for bringing that to our attention. Are there any new business topics not anticipated? Are there any Form A and r subdivision applications? Chris? We do have a Form A, and it's very complicated. And I actually have it on the um, overhead, so I'm going to put it up there. But before I show you the overhead, I'm going to um, pass around a drawing that um, Pam created, which um, shows the current mm -hmm. configuration of two lots on Bay Road. One of them appears to be a flag lot, but it's actually not a flag lot because it has an extended um, frontage. So it's got kind of a wedge down by the road that gives it the appropriate amount of frontage. And the other lot um, also has the appropriate amount of frontage um, on Bay Road to the west, to the west. Um, the frontage being in the RO zoning district, so it only has to be 150 feet. But anyway, um, the applicant is coming up with a very um, complicated way of subdividing this property, but I think I can explain it to you so you'll understand it. And Jason Skills did sign off on it, although he gave the applicant some advice about um, better ways to subdivide the property in the future. So anyway, here is the plan as it currently exists.
Okay. Um, I think I'll use the pointer. Oh, excuse me. I think I'll use the pointer to describe this. So the current um, plan uh, is this and this and this and this and this and then it goes down to this little wedge down here as you can see. So this strip here, it looks like it's a narrow strip, but it's really actually 40 feet plus 80 feet. So it's actually 120 feet wide and then it um, expands down here at the road. So this lot is already built upon. And there's a lot back here, which shows up a little bit on that plan that I just circulated. And then there's this lot here, which has um, access or frontage on Bay Road in a wide swath over here and in a narrower swath over here. So what's being proposed is that um, this lot here with the house on it, which isn't currently a flag lot, even though it appears to be, is going to become a flag lot. And so it's going to have this narrow 40 foot wide strip going down to Bay Road right here. And then the house already exists. And the driveway um, goes partially in the new 40 foot strip, but then it also goes into the 80 foot strip next door, which is right there. Now, this lot back here will become a not to be considered a separate building lot because it doesn't have any frontage. But sometime in the future, this lot could become a building lot because there's this strip that's been created here, parcel E, which is 80 feet wide, and ends right here. So it's not connected to this parcel. These are two separate parcels. Parcel B1 and parcel E. So at a future date, if somebody wanted to create a flag lot, they could combine these two sections here and go to the, come back to you with an ANR plan and then go to the Zoning Board of Appeals to get a special permit for the flag lot. Meanwhile, this, which is being created as a flag lot, will be going to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a special permit for the flag lot on May 9th. Um, meanwhile, this piece of land here, see these little jiggery marks here and here? That means that these property lines are going away. So this is all going to become one lot, this whole thing, and it, around like that. And that doesn't include this. This is separate. So do you have any questions? Well, yeah. Let's say Christine and then oh, David. Sorry. Mine's no. simple, just clarification. So, so there's a pre-existing house on that lot, and is there a house on this not included little part? Like what's In this this area? Uh, no, no. On the on Bay Road. Here. On Bay Road. I nope. think there. Then go over even more, like the center of the frontage. I think there might be a house here. Oh, you think there might I'm be not sure. Too? I think there is a house on one of these, but I'm not sure. Well, actually, I and think there is a house right here. And if we can pick up, yeah, I could look up the... Um, if you move to your right, this yeah, two that, what's right. in that chunk? Is that a house? I don't think and that's being affected at all. No, it's it's not. no, but I'm just wondering, is there a house okay. there? Yeah. Is that structure. someone's house? I can find out. Let me look up the um, GIS. So hold on a minute. I'm like that. Like it looks like there's one or two houses there. Sorry. I think Actually, Jack's yeah. question is why is there no structure shown on parcel 26A-38, which is the larger of the two proposed? There's a and 39 and 30. The driveway towards the center of the. Maybe I should look at that plan that yeah, that, you have. Yeah. Yeah. That was dated. <laughs> Maria? What is the address again? Because we can look on Google Maps. Chris, do you know the address of one of the houses shown in the map? This house is 389 Bay Road. Okay. And one of these others must be 391. Probably this one, right? Because this has a, ha this has a house on it. 
There's the driveway to that second house. And there is the corner of the second house right there. You see that? That's the corner of 391. So there is definitely a house on there. Okay. And so the drawing we were just shown shows what will be achieved by this ANR. Is that right? Or is that? This is the existing that's condition. Existing. Okay. And what you're looking at here on the overhead is um, the ANR. And mm -hmm. the main um, intent of this is to create this flag lot and to combine these lots to make them all part of this house lot. So can I just finish oh. on one more? So that house, their driveway comes down right now. Are you saying that they're going to put a driveway in that goes out their other frontage? No. They don't need to. No, they're going to continue to use this driveway. They're going to keep and they'll be having an easement across this property. Maria? Oh, I was just going to add that there is a house on that little square on Bay Road. That's what I should say. And yeah. the That's lot a... behind it looks like it's, there's Another nothing. One. There, yeah, there are. Those are not affected by this ANR. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So there's a house. There's a house on this lot, and there's another one on this lot, which you can see on these on this plan here. And so the the access or the flagpole for parcel B1 is being created, but they remain two separate parcels. That's right. Okay. All right, and I'm sure staff did an analysis and determined that this is suitable and is approval not required. We've had several conversations with Jason Skeels and also with um, Tom Reedy about this. And um, it will go before the zoning subcommittee, and I mean not the zoning subcommittee, the zoning board of appeals, and they'll they'll look at everything having to do with this new flag lot that's been created. So I think um, I think we're we understand what's going on here. Okay. Do you authorize the chair to sign the plans? Any objections to that? No. Okay, I will sign them then. Thank you. <laughs> All right, moving on. Are there any upcoming ZBA applications? I think there aren't any upcoming ones that we haven't already told you about. Okay. Upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Only Amir McChi and his property on Southeast Street, we've already told you about that, but we haven't actually received the application yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports. I think we'll just do this on an opt-in basis. Are there any Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports? I would just mention that the Affordable Housing Trust uh, presented to the Town Council recently about our request um, regarding the East Street School that uh, the Town Council essentially approve an RFP that's gone out to use the East Street School for affordable housing purposes. and. Uh, the proposals seem to be received well, and the town council is going to continue discussion of that. David? How many proposed units are there for that structure? Uh, the RFP, as currently written, requires a minimum of 15 affordable units. There were some design studies done by Kuhn Riddle, which, if I recall, showed anywhere from uh, about 20 to 40 units possible on the site. Chris? I think that study is on the um, Housing Trust website, so if anybody's interested in reading it, it, you can read it. It's very interesting because it gives different scenarios about how that property could be developed. Any other committee and liaison reports? All right, a report of the chair. Uh, we're getting out of here before 10 o'clock, which is <laughs> not too bad. <laughs> so thanks for that, everyone. A report of staff? I have no report, but thank you very much for receiving all of the information that you were sent in the last 24 hours and digesting it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. I will be adjourned. Till next time.